party? Yeah. I do. Uh, the only it's party that I remember is the D and D party I run weekly on Roll Twenty. <laughs> I finally Scam canceled ability. my, my Roll Twenty Roll Twenty account that I had like for five years and never used. <laughs> yeah, just, same here. Gave yeah. up on believing I was ever going to yeah. use it. I do. Uh, the only party that I remember is the D and D party I run weekly on Roll Twenty. <laughs> Oh man. Oh, Richard, I think you're That's a hell yeah. of a lag. <laughs> no, I think it was the YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah, that was the YouTube. I think that just kicked on. Feedback. My sister, uh, who is generally into games, a like intro to Call of Cthulhu RPG for Roll20. And it became clear very quickly this was one of those like, well, if you don't like it, I know someone who does scenarios. And um Still have not gotten 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 to get to play anyone with that. So if anyone wants to do some Call of Cthulhu, I have. <laughs> I've heard it's great, like but I haven't played. Though. Call yeah. of Cthulhu is my introduction to role playing games when I was like twelve. Oh fuck, that's a that's a pretty hard introduction to role playing. Oh yeah, no my my friend's older brother. We'd have like nine of us play too. It was the range was like twelve to eighteen, and my friend's older brother would run, and we'd just like light candles and try to scare the hell out of us. It's a good time. It's, it's just a, it. back then. It's just such like a huge like spreadsheet of stats too. It's like this D one hundred. Oh yeah, and back none of then, them like, ever like, matter. You want to do math? <laughs> it's like, oh, no. you want to shoot the weird face coming out of the door? Good luck with that. <laughs> you have a one percent chance on this one hundred percentile dice. Yeah. I apologize for still trying to figure out technology. I see a button in the top uh, left that says live on YouTube. Oh, copy yeah, streaming. Yeah, do you think? Yeah, that, it looks like it's yeah. working. Oh. Is the YouTube does, does, anyone have, does anyone have the YouTube to see if we're on it? Yeah, um, I copied the link from the top left corner and I have it in my other monitor here. Looks oh, like sweet. it's great. Yeah, streaming live just on a little bit of a lag. Are we on Twitter? The lags, the the lags typically intentional just in case like somebody explodes or something and you need to cut it. Yeah, in case anyone tries to scanners us. Yeah. <laughs> God, I wish. See here, I will shoot this around. I will be like much better dressed if we were being scannered, though. <laughs> they have great wardrobes in those movies. Hey, this shirt rules, okay? <laughs> this shirt's awesome, but everyone in scanners is like wearing tweed vests and like overcoats and stuff. That's true. So is look there a next. zoom effect for exploding heads? Because having a scanner zoom stream would be pretty fun. Richard, I'm taking a look, and if I click your link, I just get to your page hmm. in the uploads. I'm not necessarily getting to the live stream. If you're in the zoom window and you look in the top left corner, um, there should be a little thing that says live on YouTube. And if you yes, click the drop down, uh, yeah. there's a copy it's, streaming link. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, I was just curious because the uh, the one that's in on Twitter is not that one. Oh, really? So if you want people watching, you might want to swap the link the, that's on Twitter. The one I put up on Twitter is functional. So you want me to share this on Twitter then? Uh, uh, oh, I have what you want to do? I was just noting that if I click the one on on the uh, the post on Twitter, it doesn't take me anywhere. Oh, really? The one that's, uh, okay, interesting. <laughs> I like that the yeah. thumbnail is a picture of Nick doing this. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Quality. That's good. I wonder, uh, what's Nick tipping his hat. Doing? People are more likely to click if it's Nick's face. <laughs> it's true. There we go. It's, it's, uh, it's search engine optimization, I guess. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, so that link works. Should I just delete the other one? Yeah. So no one gets confused? Probably. Okay. Could you also put it on gallery view? Yes. Top right. Yeah, just a sec. Yeah, because when I went over to YouTube, it was just, it was all Nathaniel, which is not a problem. Not that's a, problem. a good mustache. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little, that's a little much pressure for me though. <laughs> Sometimes I also do not like being observed. I do not, what is it? What was the thing that was going around? Like, I do not wish to be perceived. Yes. Yeah, I really feel that sometimes. Yeah, at any given point, really. I like that meme. I think my 
contribution to this party will be making Kara Age in the background. Um, unless you're, you're a little bit quiet, Sam. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. I guess I can yell in, into my, I can just fill the stream with my face. And maybe <laughs> That's good. It's a good face. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a good face. <laughs> hmm. um, I was saying my contribution for this will be um, making a uh, karaage Japanese fried chicken for the background for, for everyone in the background. And if you're not, if you don't show up, I might just have to eat it for you. <laughs> I understand. So um, now I am jealous I'll, of the chicken. I'll keep myself. I don't think we're all jealous of the, of the chicken itself. Cause that chicken, I think had a bad day. Um, but, um, but the, yeah, but I'll, unless anyone's weirded out by that. I'll keep myself on mute to not inundate you with my kitchen noise. So I guess it sounds like you don't really hear me anyway. So that's, that's, yeah, that's nice. true. I think last time we found that it's actually kind of nice when people don't have themselves on mute because then we get live reactions to the presentations and it's less of just <laughs> like crickets. Yeah, that's good. Cool. All right. Am I missing anything? Are, are, are we functioning the, now? The, it looks like the live YouTube is still going to speaker view. Oh no, I think that's it for me. Maybe oh, the okay. leg is just longer on your end. Oh yeah, now it is. It was the cool. Minneapolis leg. <laughs> it's longer to get yeah, there from I'm, Seattle. I'm the closer the to wires the wires are colder so, up here. Yeah, the, the tubes get to us oh. pretty quick. It's fixed on my end. Cool. <laughs> How many presentations do we have tonight? I don't know. How many people actually follow, followed through? I got one. <laughs> I got one. Yeah. Sweet. That's enough. Um, can I get uh, either or Nick? Can you make a spinner? Uh, to the Google. Wheel of names dot com. Um, before we went live, it was, oh, don't worry that you didn't do it. Now that we're live, it's who didn't follow through. Fuck you. <laughs> you so, there. I stand in judgment shame. of you. So we've got Richard, Eva, Nick, Ewell, and Chad. Yes. Anyone else? Am I missing anyone? Hey, Chad, is that a Sephiroth shirt? Uh, this is an Alucard shirt from Castlevania Symphony of the Night, but it's very close to Sephiroth. I, I think they're of a type, but it's very cool. I like Definitely. it. Definitely. Ooh, same, Richard. Same, like within years, same generation. Oh, Richard, yeah, you're, you're right. going to need to turn on uh, participant screen sharing for us to do this. In general, yeah, the... the um, as soon as the silver-haired anime villain in goth clothes comes out, like whether or not they're the villain, because they're usually not revealed to be right away. Mm -hmm. um, they, like they this? Be, but they're all roughly within the same category. You know, I was thinking the, that when this is done, I might dye my hair silver. because I've been growing it out. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I dyed on um, silver sideburns just for, this, for the reading I did last month. Oh, nice! Yeah, <laughs> this is fancy. This is all dyed. <laughs> it's I'm I'm an old older person now. Mm. I, I wish mine was all gray. I love gray hair. I was getting Same. upset that I'm starting to go bald without the gray to like be oh, the no. cool part of it. <laughs> yeah, it's like what the fuck. I found I a six. life hack, which is to get a barber to become your roommate. Ooh, ooh. Or you can get your roommate to become your barber. <laughs> That's what I did. That's what I did, yeah. <laughs> how do I make, how do I make it so that you can all share your screens? Anyone know? Um, <laughs> don't know how to do that. <laughs> oh, go down to... Sh hmm. It's on the bottom somewhere. Yeah, I share screen. Say, like, allow. I mean, the, the messy hack would be to make them everyone hosts. There's some kind of admin panel that you have on the very bottom. It looks maybe like if you click on admin. share. Oh, yep, you, you did it. I can, yeah, I can do share it. now. For anybody watching, this <laughs> is all performance art. We know what totally. we're doing. We do, yeah. This hey, is all Tiver's part of the chat. Speak well, for yourself, man. I don't know shit. Hey, Tiver. <laughs> all right, let me pull the chat up. You should get a gray streak, Tiber. It's cool. Gray streak, Tiber. 
I don't think gray or white hair is in my future, but during my last project, I did have a streak of white go through like one of my eyebrows. So Fuck I've yeah. got that going for me. I just wish it would do the comic book thing and like go all the way up. So it, you had some consistency, but yeah, I did like it's like underneath though. So uh... and it starts to fade after like a month or so. So you have to keep it up if you want to do it. And I don't actually care that much, especially right now. Yeah. It looks like we lost Nick, so you might have to let him back in. Oh, no. Yeah, he, he's saying for the living room to let him in. <laughs> there he is. I make my triumphant return. Welcome. Thank you. I had to change some settings to let me uh, screen share, apparently, on my <laughs> computer. Um, I do have the wheel of name is ready to go if you want to get that going. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Do it. Does anyone have, um, I guess I don't have my YouTube up because it was causing like weirdness, but I, I, people are commenting on there with anything. I don't know if someone's monitoring that as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a, a third yeah. lentil stew on there now, so we don't know who's real. Who could it be? Well, it's like multiplicity. Wait, a third lentil stew? I mean, like we have Nathaniel, and is it lentil or is it actual person? Like, what the fuck is going on? I have, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it, that's, that's very baffling. Who knows? Yeah. Wait, can we get I don't think that actual person has like a real form. Yeah, yeah I, mostly I think incorporeal. A, I kind of yeah. missed. What's Sam? Can we get? I don't know why I'm so quiet. Can we get a preamble uh, from Richard or whoever about what the hell we're doing? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, uh, I invite my friends. We're going to have a weird PowerPoint party. We're going to share some things. And I don't know what my friends are sharing. Besides, I did see what Will's doing on Twitter. Um, we've done this a uh, couple times and we posted one to the internet live before. It was pretty awesome. And uh, I apologize for all of the like, you know, watching us trying to figure out how technology works, but um, hopefully it's working now. It's a universal human experience this year. Yes. Yeah. I've probably Zoomed, since I'm still actually going in to work in person, I've done less Zooming than the rest of the world. So maybe, maybe I could have passed off some of these duties to other people. You're doing less Zooming, but more being vaccinated. That's true. Yeah. Less Zoom in, more human. You would, I, I would, you would think that I would actually be out like living my life, but the, the rest of you guys aren't vaccinated yet. So I'm still just twiddling my thumbs waiting. Uh, speaking of twiddling thumbs and waiting, shall we get the, uh, the, the wheel of names going? Great segue. Let's do it. Let me, uh, let me see. Are you guys seeing what I'm sharing now? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Spinning it. God damn it. <laughs> Boo. No, the confetti is a nice touch. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me get my presentation going. Uh, speaking of pre uh, not knowing how to actually present things, um, let me see if this is going the way I expect it to. <laughs> um. Hey, can you see, can you see the act? Do you see like the app itself or do you see like the full screen presentation? I see I the full screen. Presentation. Yeah. Presentation. Yeah. Dope. Is it just like a picture of, of a satellite Earth. picture of earth? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah and then two earth. pink lines. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Um, my name is Nick. Uh, and today I'm going to be presenting, uh, not necessarily something particularly weird or funky, uh, as, as the theme may be. Uh, it's hopefully kind of a little bit more uh, educational. And I'm going to be talking about extremes on Earth. Cool. Yeah. Hell yeah. So to begin, planet Earth is very dope. It's true. Um, since the dawn of time, humans and other sentient animals have known that the Earth is dope. <laughs> uh, humans seeking to understand. We like to measure things, especially things that are dope. Um, I, seeking to understand, but not liking to put in much effort, like to think about humans measuring things. The doper, the better. And thus I am the perfect person to tell you about some dope selections from my favorite Wikipedia page, Extremes on Earth. But first. Brought to you by Mountain Dew. <laughs> about <laughs> me. 
Hey, my name is Hot. Nick Wood. Damn. <laughs> yeah, spicy Damn. boy. This was uh, this was back before I had to wear a mask all the time. Uh, I was wearing a different kind of mask in these days. Um, I live in South End, Seattle, Washington. Um, beautiful, beautiful, best part of the city. Um, I'm husband to Eva Wood, uh, and I am homie to my dog Data. Um, I'm a photographer, a bike dude, a wilderness man, and an all-around cool guy. At least I hope. That's true. Yeah, accurate. Uh, I also wish I had pursued a role in GIS, Geographical Information Systems, um, basically the measurement of um, of Earth and the way that uh, we just measure maps and and such. Uh, and as a result, um, I have a fascination with this type of stuff. So that is why I am qualified to tell you all about extremes. Uh, I'm going to start. I've got three sections here that I want to talk about. I'm going to start with the most boring of them, uh, extremes of temperature, yeah. just to get this out of the way. Um, so I want to start off talking about inhabited extremes. Um, humans live just all over the goddamn place. Um, one of the primary traits of being a human is going over the next hill and seeing what's there and settling down. Uh, even if that means settling down somewhere blisteringly hot or frighteningly cold. <laughs> um, while the convenience of modern life does make this easier, uh, the extreme places have been inhabited by indigenous peoples since time immemorial. So the modern conveniences just smooth out the bumps. Um, but these are places that humans have been uh, and continue to be and will be long after the fall. Um, just never bet against the tenacity of the human spirit. That's a, that's a good bet right there. So I wanted to start talking about the coldest continuously inhabited place on the planet, which is unsurprisingly a town in Russian mm -hmm. Siberia called Oymyakon. Oy Oymyakon. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, I just read this on the internet on my favorite Wikipedia page, Extremes on Earth. Oy, my Akon. Oy, my Akon. <laughs> Oy, my Akon uh, back. The or average Aiken hands, breaking in grants, <laughs> breaking in mic stands. The average annual low, so um, across years, the average low is negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit, and the average high is 58.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which, when you think about it, that swing alone, just that huge broad range of, of average temperatures, would make it kind of ridiculous to live here. Um, here in Seattle, um, our very hot average day is like mid 80s and our average cold day is like mid 40s so i mean you need such a large wardrobe space for clothes to span that i know mm -hmm. fur coats you know preferably made of like something fancy and warm like mink they and take short, up a lot of space and short shorts all the yeah. way short shorts individually hung up on their own shorts. little hangers um, clearly, as the picture demonstrates, you've got to have your uh, your Lenin statue in there somewhere. So that also takes up some space. <laughs> um, it gets a lot colder in Antarctica um, and the place is technically inhabited year round. Uh, but the inhabitants of Antarctica technically or not technically, but tend to stay less than a year. And so are considered visit visitors. So Antarctica can suck it. Um, next up, we've got the hottest continually inhabited place. Uh, a picture of it is right here. Um, it's no longer inhabited, but it was continuously inhabited. It's a town called Dalal. Uh, it's an Ethiopian mining town in the Afar Desert. Uh, it has been abandoned since at least 2005 when census stopped counting the area. Uh, so it is considered a ghost town. Uh, the hottest average annual temperature is 93 degrees Fahrenheit, which the key there is average annual temperature. If you take the temperature at all times of all day in the year, for an entire year, the Ooh. average is 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, fuck in that. That's awful. <laughs> the record high temperature is 121, and the record low is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But is it like a dry heat? Because if it's like a dry yeah. heat, <laughs> it's like <laughs> just cough. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, no. It's, uh, it's some kind of heat. I would call it a blistering heat. Um, <laughs> The place is at negative, or not negative, it's uh, it's 430 feet below sea level. So you get that kind of like extra crush of the atmosphere on top of it too. Oh yeah. It's good stuff. It's really good stuff. Um, this is the kicker. Records were only kept between 1960 and 1966. So because of global warming, uh, it is likely much hotter there now in the 21st century. Um, 
which is probably why no one fucking lives there anymore. Yeah, fuck that. Crazy. Um, measuring heat is kind of just an aside here. Um, it seems pretty basic, but there's a lot of ways that we do it. Um, there's there's pretty obvious ways. You know, you've got the the weather app on your phone. You've got the an old mercury thermometer, all kinds of stuff. But you also have, as we see here, satellites. Um, ground temperature tends to be much hotter than air temperature because surfaces store heat much better. Um, there is a theoretical maximum uh, of how hot the ground can be on planet Earth, and it's somewhere between 90 and 100 degrees Celsius, depending on the type of soil, uh, the color of the soil, its mineral content, and its thermal conductivity in general. Um, so there's two types of measurements we're going to be talking about for this next section. Um, point measurements, measuring a very specific point on the ground at a very specific point in time. So you set your thermometer on the ground, or I bet one of the ways that most of us are familiar with point measurements these days is the little laser thermometer on your forehead before you try to go somewhere or go into work. That's a point measurement. Um, the reason we've got the satellite here, this is the Aqua satellite. Um, it has a thermometer tool on it called MODIS. Um, and the MODIS thermometer is a large scale uh, reading of an area uh, over a period of time and it's Hi. average. So you set your thermometer on the ground or I bet one of the ways that most of us are familiar with point measurements these days is the little laser. Someone's music just, hey, there it is. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to know that YouTube is working. That's cool. Um, so satellites are how we're figuring out uh, long-term trend lines um, for things like um, global warming these days. Obviously, there weren't satellites forever, but they're giving us the best um, kind of like global average temperatures. Yeah, like a speed to death measurement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, how fast? Like right. how how quickly we we boil uh, into just a, a, a soup, a soup how, of human. Of all like these same types of things, how quickly do they die in a row? Yeah, okay. yeah cool. Definitely. Um, if it's any consolation, knowing uh, by our history in one of our previous slides, um, humans will be one of the last things to turn into a boiling cod with a sludge. I thought you were going to say, based on one of our previous Earths, that has been around. <laughs> Back on Earth one. Um, let's talk about hottest surface temperatures. Um, as far as point measurements go, the hottest measurement ever taken uh, on a specific point um, probably unsurprisingly, was in Death Valley, a place called Furnace Creek, uh, on July 15th, 1972. Remember, this is a measurement of the ground. This is before we had um, laser thermometers, and so this was done just with a standard thermometer, and it was a fucking ridiculous 201 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I would imagine that at that point, walking around um, on shoes would probably start to melt the sole of the shoe. Um, Satellite measurements averaged over an area reveal that Iran's dasht e lut desert uh, is the consistently hottest place on the planet. Um, the average high temperature in the Lut desert is a ridiculous 159.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're not good with heat, uh, stay out of the Lut desert, even though, as we can see on the right side of the screen, it's a beautiful looking place. The Lenin statue might melt depending on what it's made out of. It's true. It's true. Um, you can melt the statue, but you cannot melt uh, the ideology. Um, coldest surface temperatures. Uh, satellite measurements of Antarctica found the coldest temperature uh, ever recorded at negative 136 degrees Fahrenheit on August 10th, 2010. Uh, the Southern Pole of Inaccessibility Research Station, more on that later, has it's the world's name. coldest year-round temperature at negative 72.8 Fahrenheit, um, which is truly, absolutely, absurdly fucking cold. So now that we've talked about temperature, which again, I thought that was the most boring section, um, I want to talk about some of my favorite stats on the Wikipedia Extremes on Earth page, which are stats about elevation. So let's get high. Uh, what's the highest mountain on Earth? It's obviously Mount Everest. Duh. This is child shit. Um, this map right here shows it with uh, its its uh, its real name, its its indigenous name, which I can't really pronounce. It's I think Chomolongma, uh, but it's a really cool map. So um, how did we how did we uh, in English speaking countries start calling it Everest? Uh, probably the name of some white dude who saw it first and was like, "I invented that." Colonialism, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
I thought for a second you're gonna have a hot scoop about the actual highest mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. Um, being the tallest point, it's got to be the furthest point from the center of the Earth, right? Wrong. So let's go a little deeper on that. Uh, to do so, we're going to need to talk about the shape of the Earth. Earth is not a perfect sphere. Uh, far from it. It is something called an oblate spheroid. And same. Yeah. <laughs> Feeling a little oblate as of the, uh, you know, t- you know, count down towards the end of this pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we're looking at this diagram here on the right, axis C is our rotation axis. And like a ball of pizza dough spun on high, spinning along axis C causes axis A to lengthen. Um, so axis A has a greater distance to the center point than axis C. Uh, even though they are both a measurement from the surface to the center point, um, they are different lengths. So Earth and all rocky planetary bodies um, will have this shape uh, because as long as they rotate. Um, because they're not actually solid. Like, I mean, you can go to Earth and pick it up, and it's like a bunch of stuff that you can crumble in your hands. So technically, at a far enough scale, it's plasticky and will morph its shape based on rotational dynamics. And as a result, the point furthest from Earth's center uh, is the summit of Chimborazo uh, at 20,548 feet in Ecuador. Uh, this is 3,967.1 miles from the Earth's center. The summit of Mount Everest, while about 8,500 feet taller, is 7,113 feet closer to the center, uh, in spite of being much taller than Chimborazo. So Everest, that big bitch, can suck it. Now, the fastest point on Earth. Uh, this one, I think, is super fascinating. Um, the fastest point on Earth is going to be defined as the point furthest away from the rotational axis. So kind of like a, 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 a perpendicular from the rotational axis, as far away as you can go while still being on the ground, um, is going to be the fastest point because it's going to be rotating the fastest. Think of a record spinning. Um, the track on the inside of the record is obviously spinning slower than the outside of the record, even though they have the same RPM. So this honor belonged to the summit of Volcan Cayambe in Ecuador, uh, which is actually really close to Chimborazo from earlier. Um, Cayambe is shorter than Chimborazo, uh, but being closer to the equator, it means that there's a greater distance from the rotational axis. Zoom, zoom. <laughs> now, points closest to the Earth's center kind of depend on how you measure it. Um, the point on the surface closest to the center uh, is going to be sea level at the North Pole. Uh, once again, this is just because of the oblong spheroid uh, we talked about earlier. It's axis C. The top of axis C is going to be the shortest point on the surface uh, from the uh, center of the Earth. But if you're not measuring the surface, if you're measuring the ground, uh, the closest to the center is the Litka Deep. 17,881 uh, feet cause... below sea level, north of Svalbard. Now, this isn't the deepest part in the ocean. The deepest part in the ocean is the Mariana Trench at 36,201 feet, almost twice as deep as Lithka Deep. But the bottom of Mariana Trench is nine miles further from the center. So it just kind of shows how kind of oblate that spheroid shape is. So my, my, my son and I used to go to the beach with shovels all the time. And, uh, and it was like, an, it was cheaper than, than having a gym membership to just dig as deep as, <laughs> as humanly possible at the beach. And, and so, you know, we did that and we got some really impressive holes and uh, like so, so much that like all of the uptight mothers in Seattle you know, were, are like looking at, like, they're really worried that someone's going to fall in and injure themselves. And they're, they're like, you're going to make sure you fill that in now, sweetie, aren't you? Right. Like, well, so, listen to what the is, whispering down there says and I'll obey it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, so how close was my hole, do you think, to that? Mm. It was pretty, uh, good. pretty good. Yeah. Hard to say, um, <laughs> considering that we are at, uh, if the North Pole is zero degrees and the equator is 90 degrees, uh, we're at about 44, 45 here in Seattle. So kind of right there in the middle. So on that oblate spheroid, um, you're going to have to dig a little bit kind of 
halfway between 17,661 feet and 36,500 something feet. Um, okay. The difference is between Lithka Deep and Mariana Trench uh, in order to kind of beat that, that number there, if that helps. Yeah, uh, I'm going to wear down a couple shovels doing that, but that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Man, digging a hole is, is hard work for real. Like, like there's always more dirt in a hole than, than space that the hole takes up. There's myself. nothing more satisfying. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I mean, it's, it a, it's a real kind of like artisanal way to measure your way to death too, as we were talking about earlier. So, I mean, it's for the hands-on crowd. Yeah, definitely. I like, I like every once in a while digging one that's just going to be the size of um, a coffin. Um, so I can just know where the eternal rest will take place. Um, speaking of coffin, if you were to fall down the greatest purely vertical drop on planet Earth, mm, you segue. would um, well done. not need a coffin because you would be made out of jelly at that point. Well, um, this is a painting uh, of uh, <laughs> the greatest purely vertical drop um, on planet Earth. Uh, it is called Mount Thor. Um, Obviously, because Earth changes, because geography is constantly moving, um, the greatest purely vertical drop will change uh, along geological timescales. But right now in 2021, uh, it is Mount Thor on uh, uh, Baffin Island in Canada. Uh, this cliff drops pure vertical 4,100 feet. That is, that is almost a mile um, from the top of that cliff to the bottom of that cliff uh, with an average overhang of 15 degrees from vertical. And... Uh, yeah, located in a national park on Baffin Island in Canada, um, and kind of for obvious reasons, um, and despite its remoteness, it is a world-class climbing destination. Get some um, sweet air off that thing. Yeah. Hell yeah. What I wouldn't do to just climb up the edge and then uh, uh, jump off and then press X on my Nintendo Switch controller and then have my little um, Zelda <laughs> glider uh, to just go down. I I'm very glad this ended with a video game reference and not just like, you saying, what wouldn't I give to just jump off that thing <laughs> and that's how many rotations do you would get <laughs> and how long it would take to fall from the top to the bottom we could do that calculation like, oh man i just remembered something i actually wanted to do in life <laughs> oh, <fuck>. <laughs> <laughs> i just remembered my to-do list from work <laughs> you don't have a lot of time well, to think you. about it you was good at math you can figure that out real quick how long is that how long is that fall <laughs> um sorry to put you on the spot <laughs> you'll black out probably uh, close to the bottom so you'll but, me but measured in oh an amount of oh fucks that. you could say in that time how many oh fucks would it be <laughs> imagine hearing the beautiful sounds of the echoes off of the crazy north face of mount thor uh on your way down i would like to now talk about extremes of remoteness um once again, I just kind of want to start by defining the idea of remoteness. Um, remote places are usually remote for a reason, and that reason is that they're often extremely oh, hospitable sure. to uh, being alive on this planet. Um, or yeah, definitely emotional. Because remoteness. they're my parents. <laughs> <laughs> just distant. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Um, one of the best ways to define remoteness is through a term called a pole of inaccessibility. Um, a pole of inaccessibility is a point that is furthest from any other given point. So furthest point away from land or the farthest point inland away from an ocean, et cetera. Um, and then just for later, the opposite of remote, uh, what might that be? Would it be closeness? Uh, is, it, is it proximate? And how could we measure that? And I think that uh, we're going to measure that in the best way possible. Um, but I want to start by talking about Point Nemo, the oceanic pole of inaccessibility. Uh, it's the point furthest from land in any direction. So the most distant place in an ocean uh, where you are surrounded most completely by ocean on all sides. Uh, point Nemo is down here in the South Pacific. Um, and it is the, in a lot of ways, considering how much an ocean is kind of like the ultimate inhospitable place uh, for a human, um, this is probably the most remote possible place you can be on the surface of the planet. Point Nemo, the closest land is 1,670 miles away, and that's uh, actually Easter Island, Rapa Nui. Um, it's a, a small point off of Easter Island that is considered part of the island called Motonui. Um, 
the closest large city uh, to Point Nemo uh, is in New Zealand, uh, which gives you an idea of the distance there. So how uh, did they actually go about finding Point Nemo? Uh, it's, it's mostly, so I, I don't 100% know. Um, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm reciting a Wikipedia page that I, that I read. And I was just making a Disney cartoon joke. It's, we don't need to know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, CB, I'm not, I'm not an adult Disney fan, so not really my, my thing. Is, is, so uh, are there any... Like I've lost in that one. <laughs> are there, uh, how many continents of trash are there in this in this uh, radius though? there's chat room right now yeah that's, a, oh. <laughs> that's an interesting point actually the uh, the pacific garbage gyre is within this circle and very close to point nemo a garbage the, uh, gyre the yeah. gorillas album plastic beach is about <laughs> um it's so true. one of the cool things about uh, one of the cool things about Point Nemo is that oftentimes the closest humans to Point Nemo are astronauts aboard ISS. Um, the next coolest point, actually, I would probably say this is even cooler. Point Nemo is a spacecraft cemetery um, because Point Nemo is f- the place furthest away from land and therefore the least likely place to be inhabited on the planet. Uh, when satellites and space stations need to be deorbited when they've reached the end of their life, deorbiting is a pretty precise thing that we can do um and they tend to get deorbited right into point nemo a um, couple of other interesting things about that not only is it the least likely place for a space station to fall on top of a human point nemo is kind of a void of sea life as well because it's so far away from a continental shelf uh, and because it kind of is where the pacific gyre is uh, there's basically no nutrients at Point Nemo, which means there's basically no sea life. There is a shitload of plastic, though. So when they're deorbiting, is it kind of like they're like turning and turning in a widening garbage gyre? Uh, deorbiting would be like when the the satellite's at the end of its useful life, and it needs to. We need to basically like get it out of orbit and drop it into the ocean so that we can. Get burned he's, up in the atmosphere. He's making a reference. <laughs> 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 the center cannot hold. Yeah. Well, I mean, the orbit, yeah, it deorbited. The center didn't hold. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I, we didn't get your reference, Jordan. I don't know any references. I'm an alien. <laughs> I got so excited when you said gyre because the first thing I was like, William Butler Yates. <laughs> Can I nominate this talk for like the most potential band names? Ooh, yeah. uh, in sequence. Garbage gyre is a great garbage band gyre is really good. Full of inaccessibility. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that one's a good band name and a sex tape at the Point, same time. Ooh. Point Nemo. That probably is a band. It's probably a terrible yeah. Nemo band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, really it's, like, it's like 10 seconds to Point Nemo or something. It's like a band <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Point Nemo files. Actually, we, we would need Yule to do the calculations on how long it would take you to fall into. Point Nemo, and then that would be the. It would be some terrible math rock band, I think, at that point. Ooh, definitely. Yeah. It really is COVID. I'm getting so much homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to hang out on this, and they're making me do math. <laughs> <laughs> I come to one party in like six months, and this happens. <laughs> All right, come on, you out. Do math for us. Do math. <laughs> on Friday night. I just want to say that no one is obligated to do any sort of math whatsoever. Um, all of these numbers that I've gotten here are from Wikipedia, and I, lit- I didn't even type them. I copy and pasted them. Uh, math free zone. Yep. No math in my PowerPoint. Uh, however, uh, speaking of points, uh, the southern pole of inexpes- inaccessibility is a point that I'm about to talk about. Um, The Southern Pole of Inaccessibility is the pole of inaccessibility inland on Antarctica. Um, And it was the location of a Soviet research station. Um, It features a bust of Vladimir Lenin. It is the most remote Lenin on the planet. Um, Like all good Lenins, it faces directly to Moscow. And uh, like, probably not like all good Lenins, but probably at least like a few good Lenins, it is slowly being consumed by Antarctic ice. Um, the pole of inaccessibility does have the world's coldest year-round average temperature of negative 72.8, which was in an earlier slide, um, and uh, a triumph of the immortal science of Marxist-Leninism. 
<laughs> Very Ooh, nice. Sweet graphics. Thanks, man. So, <laughs> John Carpenter's thing had swallowed this bust of Lenin. What material would it have been made of, and thus would it be more dangerous than its form made of its flesh? Uh, this Lenin's made out of Bakelite um, or something similar, some sort of like plastic polymer. Um, and so it so would it's probably vintage. be... Yeah, it's, it's a little vintage. Um, <laughs> it would, would probably be a highly... much more fragile the thing. You know, Bakelite's highly <laughs> carcinogenic, so it probably would have one in the long game <laughs> the, the the end of the thing franchise is just the thing dies a long game of cancer surrounded by all the, the people that love it <laughs> uh and on that note uh let's talk about togetherness because we could use a little bit of that right now um lots of places claim to be the center of the world or the universe looking at you fremont and the wonderful lenin that you contain uh get another lenin I know. There's two Lenins. No, there's three Lenins in this. Three oh Lenins gosh. in this presentation. Uh, the immortal <laughs> science of Marxist Leninism marches on. Um, so how would you actually measure the center of the world? Um, obviously, there's the core of the world, but that's kind of an abstract idea. No one's ever going to visit it unless you're in a bad movie. Um, <laughs> a good definition of the center of the world would be the center of population. Um, it's basically where there's the shortest average distance between every single person on the planet. Calculating this is very complex. I read over this article multiple times and I just could not understand it. Um, but the general idea of where this is, is um, Northeast India, uh, where South and Central Asia meet. And you can see that in this diagram, each kind of point represents a, uh, a place where people live in cities uh, or in mass. Uh, and there's that huge amount of density kind of on a line um, where, uh, where Indo-Asian culture kind of arose a long time ago and still is, still is with us today. Um, and boy, we could use a little bit of that togetherness today, couldn't we? I'm glad to be here with y'all. Thank you for tuning into my PowerPoint. Um, this is humanity. This is our species. This is home. Fin. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thank You're you, welcome. Nick. Incredible. Um, great presentation. Thanks, y'all. Um, do we have any questions or should we spin the wheel? Um, I, well, I guess I was, I was really, can you, can you put on that last slide, the one about the, uh, where did you, where did you find that? Cause that is an amazing image. And I wonder, it's like, it's like seeing a city without buildings. Yeah. And like, um, where did you find that? So some of the terms that I was, um, so going through the, um, the center of population Wikipedia page, I came across a few different phrases that I um, put into Google uh, and tried to find some specific imagery. They kind of just showed population maps. Um, this map came from this guy who's posting various data visualization stuff on Twitter. Um, and he had a whole big block of like um, where some of the largest spikes of population are, um, and specifically focusing on the Indian subcontinent. This was kind of the overview picture, but then he zoomed into um, some other specific places and showed kind of why there's no spikes there. Um, kind of in the south of India and kind of in the like the little, the little armpit there, um, there's some empty spots. Those are all national parks. Um, and there's a, there's a really big empty spot, like totally devoid. Um, if you look kind of, go up the coastline, um, kind of close to the, the really densely populated spots, there's like a river delta that is just completely, there's not a single person there. Um, one of his images zoomed in on that. Uh, that is the largest uh, protected mangrove swamp in the world. So hmm. I thought that was kind of interesting. I have a question. If you were to, if you were allowed to visit one of these places, which one would it be? That's a really good question. I'm um, assuming it's easy for you to get there and it's easy for you to get back. Like you just get to go visit, hang out for a bit and then come back. Hmm. Uh, I'm really fascinated by um, the, I'm really fascinated by the deeps in the ocean, like the, the super, super deep places. Um, I recently found out doing research for this, that um, there's a super deep sea submarine that is designed uh, to be, reusable and capable of going to any point in the ocean. Um, it has an operating, uh, 
an operating floor that is deeper than the ocean by 10,000 feet. Um, wow. So it's reusable. They've done five, uh, five drops in it. Four of the drops have been in the Mariana Trench. Uh, and one of them was in a deep that's next to the Litka deep called Malloy deep. Um, Wait, are they and, not usually reusable? Um, they're not often reusable, I think, because I mean, of operating they come costs. In packs, so it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, one of them was James Cameron. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I say, yeah. I've seen this movie about this submarine that's totally going to make it. And you have to cut the rings off when you have the six pack so it doesn't get tangled in the giant squids. That's yeah. very true. <laughs> it's so sad when you see them tangled up in an old. Oh, uh, truly. Oh. Also, like Zelda got brought up, and we've been talking about, um, you know, Chad gave an easy out of uh, you can easily get there and easily get back. And so I think what I would do is I would go to Mount Thor. I would just jump off it. I would count how long it takes to get through it. And yes. I would put out the Sheikah slate at the bottom and just uh, come back here. <laughs> That's a good point. That's you that way we can avoid doing math too. <laughs> exactly. Have you upgraded your stamina wheels to give you enough time to, to use the paraglider off of Mount Thor? That's right. You just eat a big pile of mushrooms and be fine. Yeah, one of those like <laughs> like stamina mushroom skewers. You're solid. That's the sequel presentation I want to see is how many stamina wheels would you need to jump off of Mount Thor and get to the bottom <laughs> safely? Definitely. Perfect. Yeah, like some like really intense math and like oh yeah. Like, yeah. Oh my god. That's a good idea. I don't know. I'm not an adult Nintendo fan, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, uh, called out. Um, speaking of being called out, uh, let's go to the wheel. <laughs> yeah. Damn, so good at it. Wheel right. of morality, turn, turn, turn. Is, uh, is it showing? Are you guys seeing it? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's give it a spin. Oh, 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 yeah. Do I get to yeah. kiss myself now? No, but I can run over to the next room and kiss you if you want. Aww. <laughs> All right. Winner, babe. Um, let's see. My presentation is going to be comparatively very dumb. <laughs> so, I love dumb. Dumb's excellent. What I'm here for. I hope you guys are are into that. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout Nick's, I was like, oh, I'm so fucking glad I Already didn't do one. I have to follow Dude, this up. <laughs> I'm here to lower the bar. Um, do you guys see the actual presentation and not my notes? Yeah, see a big bottle of soap. Dr. Bronner's Miracle Soap. Pure Castile. Hell yeah, you do. 18 and All one. right. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Eva Wood, and my presentation tonight is entitled Dr. Bronner, What the Fuck? <laughs> For the uninitiated, Dr. Bronner, not a doctor, was a German soap maker who invented such products as Dr. Bronner's Magic Soaps, 18 and one Hemp Pure Castile Soap. You can get his products at pretty much any grocery store. So if you're not familiar, I'm not really sure what to tell you. Anyways, dude looks exactly the way you'd expect him to, like a mad scientist uncle. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> is that actually him? Holy fuck. That is actually Dr. Bronner. Let the, me tell you more about him. The best uh, part is the fucking dry ice coming up from the bottom. <laughs> so in 1936, Emmanuel Hale Bronner dropped the hail from his name in flight no. Germany because fuck Nazis. Sadly, his Jewish family were killed in the Holocaust. Um, when he arrived in California, he adopted the honorific title doctor, and with his German accent and extensive knowledge of soap making, nobody argued. <laughs> so on top of looking like a mad scientist, he had a German accent. Oh, yes. Thanks and those German glasses. Accent. I mean, would you really deny him the title of doctor? I no, I would exactly. I definitely call him hair doctor. Yeah. <laughs> In public places, Emil loudly espoused his beliefs that humanity must realize our transcendent unity among cultural and ethnic divides, all one or none. To the point that he was institutionalized at Elgin State Insane <laughs> Asylum. But it was not long before he escaped. This is all true, <laughs> by the way. Is this before or after his soap? 
escaped. This is before his soap. He used okay. the soap to slide through the bars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He just fucking Mr. Kool Aided through the wall and left like a like a, a crazy Nazi scientist. Safe there are surprisingly hole. few details about how he escaped, but I too am very curious. The only clue is his cell was super clean. It was just like the cleanest <laughs> cell they'd ever seen. Just reeked of Plenty peppermint. Is close to Godliness, according to Dr. Bronner. Dr. Bronner sought ways to continue to spread his all one philosophy. So he decided to start his own soap company and print the basics of his beliefs on the labels. He ran the company as a tax exempt religious organization <laughs> until the US government was like, dude, you can't do that. By then he owed $1.3 million in back taxes. Not doing math. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bronner was committed to running his newly minted corporation as ethically as possible. To this day, the company has self-imposed caps on executive pay with executive salaries not to exceed five times the wage of its lowest paid workers. Roughly a third of the company's profits are dedicated to charitable giving and activist causes annually with the drug, de drug decriminalization and animal oh, rights being a particular interest because of course. The company undergoes stringent certifications that they utilize only ingredients that have been pr produced under conditions that foster workers' rights, animal welfare, and environmental sustainability. I love this guy. So not bad. Yeah. More companies should be like that. Like that he's, he's got dude. some legit points. More companies should be religions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I read the entire Dr. Bronner's label so you wouldn't have to. <laughs> Dubbed the moral ABC, the belief system is comprised of a grab bag of religion, spirituality, environmentalism, and self-help. It is written erratically, full of non sequiturs, obscure historical references, and bizarre punctuation. Also, it kind of rhymes. All one or none. All one or none. All one or none. A typical passage goes like, to dream that impossible dream, to reach that unreachable star, till all one, all one we are to fight that unbeatable foe, to go where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong, to love pure, chaste from afar, to try your arms or to, to try till your arms are too weary, to reach that unreachable star, till all one, all one we are. It has a very team, rock, team rocket cadence, which is really nice. <laughs> the text also encourages the reader to support psychedelic assisted therapies, perhaps bafflingly compares communism to cow dung, invokes Ooh. God's spaceship Earth and repeatedly suggests that the reader be like a bird and perfect thyself first. Well, I like what this is. That means that Dr. Bronner has read Buckminster Fuller, uh, <laughs> which adds a whole lot to the lore. <laughs> I want to do a Dr. Bronner book club now. It's all required <laughs> reading to understand the label of an average like Dr. Bronner soap bottle. Dude, there, you would have to do so much research legitimately to understand everything. I have one of on these there. in my shower. Next time I shower, yeah. I'm just going to read it. Try reading it's, it. It's good shower reading. <laughs> Naturally, as a designer myself, I've always been delighted by the manic, brutalist design of Dr. Bronner's soap bottles. It is an ugly design, all utility, zero regard for legibility. Set in Times New Road in Helvetica, knocked out, justified, squished, squeezed, and wrapped all the way around the bottle with as many as 250 characters per line. There aren't many typographical sins that it does not commit, but it manages to cram over 30,000 words of ideology onto a nine and a half by six Holy inch label. Holy fuck. <laughs> what? Yes. Seriously? It is, it is a novel. Am I still screen sharing? Uh, we just, it's now showing your uh, keynote, like okay. the app. Oh, no. Okay, and now one it's second. not. Technical difficulties, friends. Give me one moment. I mean, we just start on the kerning of that stuff. I mean, we could talk all night. Yeah. It's the justified for me, like. like I feel like I'm at Sprouts right now, just like seeing this and seeing everything like line up perfectly. Like this is the Dr. Bronner design. <laughs> yeah, so that's called justification while it goes through this all again, because this will take 30 seconds. Um, it means it adds space between all the words and in fact, the letters just to make sure that it is completely dead set against either margin, which ends up looking fucking insane. And most people like, you don't really know why it's insane, but it is. Dude's got a lot to say. He's got a lot to say. 
All right, it's almost a joke amongst designers challenging each other to redesign the bottle into something more minimal, more palatable for their portfolios. But I think it's perfect exactly how it is. Taste be damned. The point is to intrigue and this design is successful. Fuck minimalism. Yeah. Dr. Bronner passed away in 1997. His grandson, David Bronner, currently runs the company. And aside from light adjustments over the years, he has refused to change the design of his grandfather's bottle or the ethos of his slightly unhinged yet chaotic good legacy. David has been arrested twice for civil disobedience, protesting limitations on the domestic production of hemp. In 2004, he planted hemp seeds on the lawn of the DEA headquarters. Oh, and in 2012, <laughs> he harvested hemp while locked in a metal cage in front of the White House. Just absolute king shit. <laughs> we also have David Bronner to thank for the legalization of magic mushrooms in Oregon. He personally donated more than $2 million to the Oregon Ballot Measure 109. And to this day, he annually donates millions to MDMA research for therapeutic purposes. That's great. Yeah. I, I can personally thank this guy for, for legalizing the expansions I've put onto my stamina rings in Breath of the Wild. There you go. So I know I'll that probably back. leaves you with more questions than answers because it certainly did for me. Um, but I hope that you've enjoyed this little presentation. Can I get a there bottle? Are, here's the... Soap. Oh, shoot. I don't know what I want that. Sorry, never mind. <laughs> you just opened up a whole new world for me. <laughs> There's nothing dumb about this. This is awesome. Yeah, this is That's fantastic. Really yeah, this fully I, rules. This guy is a very the interesting side character. By side. Yeah, so this is. Oh, how so it has evolved. Has okay. 1973 um, is my favorite. Yeah, so the original design, uh, the oldest, the greatest, you can see that they really packed it densely on there. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> um, there's a little bit more typographical finesse, I guess, in the latest two iterations. Um, and in the very last one in 2017, you can see that they actually redesigned the Dr. Bronner's All One logo there in the bottom left-hand corner of the main square, but they very much on purpose. Uh, the Dr. Bronner's company called this the old and, old and improved design because they didn't actually change anything and they insisted that nothing be changed because this is, this is the All One philosophy, the whole reason that the soap brand exists. A new goal in life is to write a novella that is only published on a label of a soap bottle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Basically what he did, 30,000 words, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, it's like the thing quarterly, but you know, in uh, the proto era, what, um, do, does anyone know what, what is Castile soap? To the internet. I think it's a kind of soap that doesn't like foam. I actually don't know. I mean, if it's not from the Castile era of France, it's only sparkling. So it's it's soap that you use in a castle. <laughs> you, you, specifically. You, jo you joke about that, but it's like it originated in the Castile region of Spain. <laughs> <laughs> only a sore spot at some point in history, but yeah, it's a uh, Castile and a Castiliano. That's oh my like God, you guys! Originally named after the olive oil-based soaps from Castile, Spain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you search for Castile soap, the first hit is Dr. Bronner's. So maybe he made it up. <laughs> uh, he stole so, it from the from the hardworking people of Castile. Yeah, that this uh, I would love a bottle of Dr. Bronner's with your presentation on it. Ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can make that happen. I mean, that's that essentially what the PowerPoint slide was. I mean, that's merch right there, right? We could have the weird PowerPoint I would need merch to store. Add a lot more. <laughs> Um, what's your favorite uh, uh, scent of Dr. Bronner's? Mine is almond. I love that smell. It's a good one. I like lavender. I like uh, tea tree, tea tree oil. Oh, yeah. I'm a eucalyptus person. I'm basic. I like the peppermint. Yeah, peppermint. Nothing wrong with that. That's good. You know, you haven't used peppermint in a while when it burns you, and that gives <laughs> you a good, you know, I like that timeline. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you forget like all that. the rules about using peppermint. Yeah. Like, the regional rules that's your soap communicating yeah. to you <laughs> oh now i remember why i didn't soap that before yes i'm glad i haven't gone yet because both these presentations like tie into mine a little too well yeah speaking Excellent. of chad right. going soon all right <laughs> uh, is is it showing the wheel it's yeah. showing the wheel all right the wheel has begun to spin 
Oh, oh, right. oh Richard. Look who it is. Well, on, Richard. Let's go. Aha. I don't know if you guys can hear this, but um, oh, yes. when the when the confetti is going off um, in my headphones, it's like a sound of of applause and people going like, "Yay!" <laughs> no, we don't get to hear that at all. Nick. I do. It's in, it's, it's in here. It's all in there. Do you want us to like cheer when one comes up? And no, uh, we'll uh, rep. Do you hear this about other random things you do on the internet too? Like in your earphones sometimes. Not, not always on the internet, but when I do something life, that I think yeah. is like re- that's really good, or, yeah, or this, this exact same sound. Yeah, it's nice. Hmm. The voices are very supportive. <laughs> hey. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought that's where you were going for a moment there. <laughs> Never apologize, Nathan. Nathan you said it. For a phenomena. <laughs> need to get a Muppet on the stream. I know at least one of us has one. Oh, right, we just got, we just got demonetized. So yeah, I actually I uh, I just left the room, but um, but in my so in my kitchen, I still have uh, a Christmas tree up because uh, my, my son digs it and um, and I, I'm fine. Oh, with yeah. It. So uh, and then uh, at the top of my Christmas tree, uh, instead of uh, an angel, I, I put my Muppet. So no. uh, what kind yeah. of Muppet? Yeah. Badass Muppet. Totally. Yeah. Chad, Chad's met my Muppet. I met the Muppet. We, we introduced the Muppet to the non-binary crime squad at PodCon, too. <laughs> Because his jackets matched our jackets, so we all have matching jackets. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go grab Steve. Okay, here's an eye patch, right? Richard disappears into the prism. We're yeah, about to find that's out. That's a really cool effect. Is, it, is the non-binary crime squad fight crime or do crime? Do crime depends on your perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah hold on. Me, while he's grabbing that, I'll grab the jacket because we got a cool patch. I, ever I, ever since I found out you can put a looping video as your background on Zoom, I want to make like a really creepy horror moment that comes into the room and leaves. Like I just walk up and look at myself yeah. and then turn around and leave. So it's for <laughs> doing crime. Uh, yeah. One of the members, Phoebe, uh, however you make patches, made a bunch of patches. You know it's Friday night. Steve's out drinking. Sorry. Okay. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. Speaking of <laughs> being Steve out takes drinking, advantage of his vaccination. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Oh man, that guy's that guy's trouble. He like, you know, I found him at Goodwill, and uh, he needed a home. And I'm like, hey man, that's you know, I, you can come stay with me for a little bit. And then he just like, I just can't so get rid of him. Later. Yeah. But uh, no, but for real, he he was on on top of my uh, tree, and now he's gone. So I don't know. <laughs> That always ends up good when a, a Muppet isn't where it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that never ends up By its way. own volition. Yeah. Okay. So let me share that. Share screen. Also, Richard, your long hair looks awesome. I just wanted to... Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a dude in my 40s, and I still have most of my hair, so I'm going with it. Yeah. You've got a real, like, Dale Cooper look going. Thank you. You know, I, uh, yeah. Do you know, I'm what a I'm nice from, thing to say. Do you, do you know, I'm, I'm from the same hometown as, uh, Kyle McLaughlin. Oh, um, oh. obviously he's a lot older than me, but my, my high school drama teacher, uh, like took credit for everything he did. Whoa. Yeah. Are you saying that maybe brothers related? <laughs> maybe. All right. So am I sharing the screen yet? Yes, yes, we yes. can see the Keynote app. If you click the play button, it will uh, take it to the full screen view. Great. OK. OK. Subconscious digital poetry, the found art of retail iPad documents. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm already so- very much on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was working Apple retail those years. This is going to be some weird fucking acid flashbacks. Yeah, so you know, April 2010, Apple introduced the iPad, and um, wait, is it changing? Um, and I uh, that was that was the same. It was actually the same week that they came out with the uh, the original iPad that I got my first smartphone. Mm. Um, and I remember, like, uh, my friend Regis and I. Uh, some of you guys may remember Regis from Twitter. 
Um, we both got smartphones that same week and we, we met at this party. This is a bit of a, a, ta a tangent before I get started. And, uh, and like, <clears throat> and we, we met after having smartphones for one week and we were, we were, um, there was like a dance floor, people were dancing and we, we just couldn't stop talking to each other about like, oh my God, our brains are changing. We're like, this, this, these, and, and at the time we didn't realize how evil this was. And we were like, that's kind of cool. Right. Like, what do you do? Yeah. Like, I feel like I'm a cyborg already, you know? And, uh, and so I remember at this party on the dance floor there, the first iPad that I saw in person on the dance floor, there was this dude who, you know, he was wearing like a blazer and uh, he was, uh, he was like dancing really sexually with, with uh, the ladies. And, and he had an, uh, he had an iPad on the dance floor the, the day they came out and he was like slapping this woman's ass with the iPad. And uh <laughs> Yeah. And, and like that, was, anyway, that's my, and so then that week I was like, Lexin. yeah, right. I know it seemed like a weird thing to do, but, um, so I, I started this really, uh, stupid hobby of, I was going to Apple stores and I, I went and got all of their, their page documents that people were trying out on the iPads. And I emailed myself all of these documents this is brilliant. Oh yeah. my God. So we auto deleted those at the end of every night. Yeah. Did, yeah. So here we go. So I'm going to, in my mind, these are found poetry and uh, they came. It seems to me like some of them are just introductions. A lot of people are like, you know, introducing themselves. Some are like weird consumer reviews. Some, uh, some people are confessing to things in these because they don't expect anyone to actually read them. Um, some are just sort of like visual collages and then some seem like channeled texts, right? So we're going to begin section one introductions. I'm going to read these like we're doing a poetry reading. Hello, my name is Jordan Gary Amanda Riley smiley face. Hi there. What are you up to? John Cleb was here. Hello, Alan. How are you doing? Whoa, interesting. Hello, what's up? Hello there, stuff. Danny and Alex are at the Apple store, the. Hey, my name is Benjamin and I can type on an iPad like a pro, ha <laughs> ha. I'm super good at this, no typos at all. Oh, yep, Amanda's filthy, not. <laughs> Section two, consumer reviews. Hi, testing. Please take a look. Is this really the future of computing? Uh, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Oh my God. <laughs> oh no. Hops, sis, ah, keyboard, <laughs> fort, yip, hard, ah, he, ha might really be able to use this. What do you think? Do you think I should get this for in exchange for babysitting? Should, should I ask her? Maybe she doesn't want it that much. It's kind of hard to type on this, but not as hard as I thought it would her. This <laughs> requires you to type with two fingers, which is annoying. It's too sensitive talks. Finger tufts. Um, I wasn't heard if is. This is a test of typing. Testing one, two, three on the pad. Here we go. Testing one, two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> How hard I'd it to type on the iPad. I'm not a touch typed, just a bad typer. Hello. Bye bye. This is hard to type on glass. This is not easy. It does not feel natural. <laughs> Life. I can't really hold it easily. How would I type hello? The urn is a negative deflection in the urn. Oh my God, I love the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> I work at the Apple store, mandate. I am showing you the iPad. I work at the Apple store, mandate. I am showing you the iPad. Oh, poor fuck. Nick is having 
PTSD flashbacks right now. I really fucking am. <laughs> this is what my wife does for a job. So yeah. Billy's Dude, bathtub yeah. bazaar. Ready or not, I will bring the heat. <laughs> if my mom can use this sucker, then it's the bomb. Happy birthday, mom. Your loving son, Reginald. Aww. It's a hell of a project proposal, Reginald. Mm-hmm. You can type easily if you fucked. You don't say. <laughs> I don't. I don't say. Look how easy it is to type. As- <laughs> <laughs> and this person, like, this person's brain is a lot more structured than mine or anyone else's. Like, this person is literally going through this process. Is it possible for me to do anything on this thing? How easy is it to export files on this device to Jai other computers? Are there <laughs> any file complications? Should I bother purchasing this device over purchasing a laptop? <laughs> Will this be the suit my needs? How difficult is this device to bring around with me compared and etc.? Is typing on this very easy? I cannot type very well on this. This is very difficult. It seems like he's got it down. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's the the, the least problems, but they I mean, still he's typing for chance and deduced. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. Dear trends, wow, I'm writing on an iPad. It seems to be smooth. Sincerely yours, your guy. <laughs> This gadget you are currently looking at is an utter necessity to life. You need to buy one. If you don't, you will probably not succeed in life. This is just a big iPhone. I guarantee you I know who, not who that person is, but I know a lot about that person. That guy's an Android troll. They come into the Apple store and are just like, can this do what my phone can do? No, it cannot. And then they leave. Nick, the, I, m- most of these came from the store that you worked at. Yeah, Maybe. I may know that person. <laughs> yeah. I want to call out that uh, in the in the YouTube comment, someone named Sarksa says it's like they're trapped in the iPad, and that is yeah. exactly the vibe <laughs> that I'm getting. Yeah. Also, I just want to note quick uh, with, with Richard and Sam both here. Um, when we were at that um, sacred and cursed night in Alameda. <laughs> drinks. Um, one of the guests there, who uh, I think you'll remember, I won't like name names because I just like don't want to put people on the spot who aren't here. But um, she used to go into Apple stores and she had learned how to ape um, Jim Davis's style and would go into Apple stores and draw Garfield and knew how to forge Jim Davis <laughs> curse of people. <laughs> Which I, I always thought was really funny. There's an old tweet of it. Um, but like I, I found that all very funny. <laughs> so, okay. Richard, this presentation is an art. Oh, fucking real. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, more? I'm looking I, forward to the confession. I actually, so yes. I actually, as a as a as attention, I actually did. Uh, after I collected these, I printed a couple copies of a book of this, and uh, oh the, and I actually a, a friend of mine um, who was an art curator put the book. Okay, but she was a weirdo. Uh, <laughs> so she she had an art show that was oh, an art curator. Yeah, um, was. <laughs> displayed inside the walls of a house that she had lived in before she moved out. She had a bunch of us make art that we don't mind like giving up for good. And uh, there was like this crawl space inside the wall that she like made a gallery out of and then sealed the wall with our art inside of. Oh, that's so good. Amazing. Yeah. And, and so this, <laughs> this exists as a, as a book in that. So when the aliens find it, you will be like the most famous people in the world. I I don't want fame, but maybe after I'm dead, that's okay. Yeah. It's like my oh, wife has that's, has that's a good. very detailed plan about how my taxidermied body is going to be left in the wall of her house when <laughs> she has moved on. I'm like, that's, this that's is a love. lot of de- really <laughs> de- love. details and price guides you've already priced out for taxidermying my body. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get a human body taxidermied? You gotta choose the right taxidermist. You can get that. Okay, step one. I mean, I mean, taxidermist. homemade is, is just as fine. Not DIY. Okay. 
Uh, a... Can I can I present an idea for uh, for this? Like you, you know, in the bodies exhibition, they have the person who's like cut like laterally, um, vertically. So yeah, you have like yeah, the, several the walls. Yeah, yeah, like in the cell, like in the movie The Cell. <laughs> so you would have like basically a, a slice of of yourself, like posthumously, like put into each wall. So when someone comes in, it's like, we need to open up this space. It's just awful. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was her plan is she wanted to be in a non-load-bearing wall. So when they break it up, when they open it up for this space, she also has planned like fake werewolf fangs and like oh my sigils God. in my bones. Amazing. <laughs> The word load bearing will be funny for me forever. Like, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell, you um, need load bearing. <laughs> Yule and Sam, I actually have right here the bats. I don't know if you can see hey, it. Yeah, the Bay Area oh. Tiki Society. Yeah, Bay Area Tiki Society. Bats. I don't even have a bat. <laughs> I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> I, didn't did, you got one right? Didn't you get one? You were? I don't. I think I I don't think I did, but that's cool. I'm, I'm a skull in there because I want to have a shadow bat at the very least in my heart. I think I need a I need a bat pin as a as a certified tiki lover. I know, right? <laughs> I have well, a bat we can, skull. We can create a similar society here for Seattle. Unfortunately, we only have about three tiki bars in town. The set what the Seattle Seattle area sat not a I'll school of bats. Nice yeah, I know it's not. The one we did karaoke at that one time, right? We did a tiki bar temporarily. Like, we did, yeah, you're right. We uh, we did karaoke. The at old it. hula hula. Is everyone <laughs> from Seattle except me? I'm from Minneapolis. Okay. I'm, I'm from the Bay, actually. So oh, nice. I'm in Los Angeles now. Oh, yeah, me too. Tiki bars are actually how I connected you all and Richard. Because I was talking <laughs> to you all at a party. And he was talking about tiki bars. I'm like, oh, you remind me of my friend Richard. And he's uh, like, Does Richard no go way. by Time Scanner? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. I'm like, oh my god! Yeah, I didn't know that time... time scanner's name was Richard until this Zoom chat. Oh, oh really? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm a human. Sorry. Yeah. Very Welcome to the fold. Yeah. I only know time scanner and then like the symbol. Yeah, and then I go up to Seattle, Seattle, and hang out with Richard. I'm like, oh, your friend. I met your friend. And he's like, I've been trying to get a hold of him. It's just like <laughs> true. Yeah, that yeah, was during the point that you all had disappeared. Yeah, I had to go dark for a bit and back in the world, but yeah, there was like a, a year where I did not exist. And yeah. I, you existed in the world, and that's when I did all my hanging out with you. Yeah. <laughs> in the world and not online. One or the other. You have to yeah. choose. Uh, Richard, I have a confession to make. Yes. I'm really enjoying your PowerPoint. And oh, I'm good. curious about section three. Here we go. Yeah. Section three, yeah. confessions. Let's do it. Dear John. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> this person was definitely considering at the moment that they were on the iPad. They were definitely considering leaving their lover. It might have been the same person. Here they are planning their escape. Oh my God. <laughs> Is HNL Honolulu? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. So this is a confession rather than simply reporting on his progress. I want to see Greg Mortensen succeed. I wish him success because he is fighting the war on terror the way I think it should be conducted. So th this person is confessing to supporting the war on terror. All right. Weird flex. Hey, at least they're supporting it the way that they think it should be conducted. Uh, dear trends, Anna, you are the best friend in the entire world. JK, I hate you. Hunt and Peck, sincerely yours, Erna Semper. Wow, that Damn, Erna. Kind of a jerk. Section four, collage. <clears throat> so here we have the pages symbol, and then it's overlapping a paragraph from uh, Winnie the Pooh. Here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now. Bump, bump, bump. Yeah. <clears throat> $5. Damn, that's a hell of a deal. Yeah. <laughs> They'll take it. Yeah, fuck. Right. Seattle markets have changed a lot since the iPad came out. True. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. They just made it look less impressive. <laughs> that climb. The Phoenix Lander. Which one do you think is think is the lander? I um, I, I can tell the guy in the back is the orbiter. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> the Phoenix Lander. Oh my god. A brief, a brief introduction to Mars, blah, blah, blah. Is that a photo of Mars? Section five, channeled texts. Good. 
How is this to actually compose prose and why? <laughs> <laughs> blarg, blarg, blarg. <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> this is the <laughs> typing on the iPad. What the fuck? I love lamp. <laughs> Who doesn't? Fad. Joe went to the store one day and decided to buy some lettuce. <laughs> The first thing they teach you at Harvard is how to love the man. Screw the man. Screw the man. <laughs> then the shape you into the man. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, dude. There's silence oh, in our voices. I thought you meant to add the, the footer text to just say footer. In the- <laughs> footer, 12. No. Washington men's crew is the best sport at UW. Don't believe me? Look it up. <laughs> he's really got the the trump for quadruple uh ellipsis yeah uh, the extra boomer dot just oh, bananas. Bananas. there they are bananas. natalie would take turn trying to type on this bitch okay scalsh of trevor is so sensitive trevor wears bikini briefs I would like to type on this, but it's kind of shitless. Whoa. <laughs> and now it's the Tom. My favorite castles. This is pretty cool. What do giraffes do? <laughs> <laughs> and in conclusion, art is for real thinking apes. The fuck? The fuck? <laughs> Very good. The end. Beautiful. Fucking yes. Amazing. I would put at least a couple of those prints on my wall. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially the one about them in. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a confession, which is partially my confession and partially confessing someone else to something, uh-huh. um, which is that I, I used to work <clears throat> on a uh, radio show uh, podcast that, and I guess this is actually still news you can use when it was sort of having a moment and like beginning to be on the upward tick, um, the host and I, when it, you know, we would have to go to the Apple store with some regularity and we would just go and subscribe every single computer um, in the Apple store and download all episodes. And then we would just build the advertisers for the increase in the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's classy. That's good. So we would like, and you could, I mean, this was like, that's, you know, you could see the bump in, we like look at the numbers. I was like, yep, that was a trip to the Apple store. <laughs> Uh, man, my you know my podcast that I haven't made an episode for in years is just it's going to skyrocket tomorrow. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be on the the hot list on on iTunes tomorrow. You know that bomb I mean, was does, money. I will tell you the, I, the <laughs> iTunes list does measure. One of the main things it measures is new subscribers, mm-hmm. and yeah. if you subscribe to 50 computers in the Apple Store, that's you know that's 50 subscribers. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, it was a petting zoo for machines, so you can just uh, go in and uh, make them your friends. I love that. Who's up? Oh, uh, I'm up with the uh, with the wheel of Chad and Yule. Uh, uh, y'all ready to give us come down to this? All right, y'all ready for this? One of the great things about this world is you can't do a sing along. Oh, there we go. All right, we can do a chat right. along, however. <laughs> okay, so I hit sh- share screen and then I go to my presentation. When you hit share yeah. screen, it'll like give you a pop up asking which window you want to share, and then you just click on the, uh, the presentation okay. window. Boom, share. Don't share the whole thing. Okay, perfect. All right. This is my presentation. Um, I've never made a PowerPoint in, the, I guess, last decade. And so just buckle up. I've, this is like 20 minutes <laughs> before this thing. 
Uh, walking way too far for way too long. Equipment considerations for walking thousands of miles in the United States. Uh, so hi, everybody I haven't met. I'm Chad Ellis. I am a sound designer and podcast person, mostly in the audio drama world. Um, and I also like walking way too far for way too long. So I imagine most of you probably don't want to do that, but some of the things that I could teach you today might come in handy. So oh. this is what this presentation is about. I'm here for this. Okay. So we're going to go, do I hit the arrow? There we go. All right, first lesson, just, just shattering uh, the standards, what they like to tell you, is that boots are bad, trail runners forever and always. Uh, so here's the thing with boots is, I feel like a lot of people get their backpacking start in relation to the Boy Scouts, whether it's a parent or you're in the Boy Scouts or whatever. And the Boy Scouts get all their habits from the military, specifically like World War II era military. So there's these ideas is that you need boots. Um, we're gonna put boots on your feet. You gotta break them in. You gotta wear multiple pairs of socks and it's terrible um, for many reasons. But as far as math goes, I'm not great at math, but this is simple math that I feel like could be convincing. So if a mile is about 2000 steps um, and, and a walk from Mexico to Canada is between 2100 and 2700 miles usually, like the Appalachian Trail is about 2100. Pacific Crest Trail is 2,600. Um, you will step over 5 million times. Uh, hiking boots is a pair are usually about four pounds and trail runners are about two pounds. So if you're thinking about the amount of steps you're gonna take and how much you're gonna lift in that time, you're looking at 20 million pounds versus 10 million pounds. Um, that alone, I feel like should be a good sales thing. But the other thing, when, when people give you uh, hiking boots, they talk about uh, ankle support which is bullshit because unless you're wearing like snowboard boots and they're going up to your knee, that's not ankle support. And if you're walking for a very long time, you are going to sprain your ankle. You're going to turn your ankle. You're going to step on a rock wrong. And it's better for you to learn the flexibility of rolling with this sprain. So you don't hurt yourself, which you cannot do with the boot because the boot, if this is your foot, like, how am I going to do this foot leg? traps you. You're, you don't have any maneuverability here. The whole thing has to go down. Um, unless you are going to, I met a guy up in Washington actually, who had hiked the entire Appalachian Trail and then hiked all the way across the country to the northern side of the Pacific Crest Trail. I oh. met him as he was hiking south. Um, oh, this dude rules. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and his plan, because I, I was like, who's this guy in a four season tent? Like it's fall. What, what's going on? And he had a sword too, because I always hiked with his sword. Um, so I had heard about this. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I think we're very lost no, no, no. over uh, a yeah, very, very important very part lead there. there. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> How much okay. you're, you're saving you're two pounds on your boots. feet with your shoes and you're gonna bring a sword hey ultralight is so that you can carry the things that you want to bring exactly <laughs> exactly the the ultralight is for comfort the sword is to pr prove to the world that ultralight is not worth the religion it's in defiance of it you're both supporting yourself and supporting your spirit at the same time what kind uh, of sword he had like a full on like broadsword, <laughs> like fucking claymore. <laughs> yeah, no. he had it. It was uh, for what do they call it? like Western martial arts? Like what? It was like a specific training sword. Mine was a plastic adventure time a sword. Was there for the <laughs> um, but in his case, uh, he he was planning on then hiking the entire Pacific Crest Trail down and then hiking to the middle of the country and then hiking the Continental Divide Trail. I love um, this dude. Yeah, wow. his, uh, oh, what was his? Um, Cooper, she's independently wealthy. Well, in his, he was an engineer for four years and had saved, I think, about $20,000. Yep. Um, and his, I forget, I'm trying to remember his trail name. It's it's a word oh, for basically going until you wow. run out of something. Um, hmm. it was, it was just... no return? March. It was, <laughs> March. I, I, I can't I can't remember his trail name, but his trail name was specifically about just burning out all of his money by hiking forever. In his case, boots make sense because you can put about five thousand pair uh, five thousand miles on a pair of boots. Uh, where a good mm -hmm. pail of trail runners, you're looking at about five hundred miles uh, up to a thousand with some Solomon Brown brands. But 
if you're only if you're going to be doing a three season hike or up to that you're looking at between 500 miles and 2000 miles and it's just better to get three or four pairs of shoes than one you know 500 pair or five to one thousand dollar pair of boots so this is this is the first lesson uh i've met three people who benefited from boots i've met dozens of people whose feet were destroyed by boots and had to walk in crocs for hundreds of miles while they were what about the instagram photos uh, I mean, that's that's where, you know, wiki feet just strikes it big because most of your Instagram for hikers, you're just looking at your fucked up, taped up feet. They're covered in like desert needles and whatnot. God, that's so right. fucking you say, real. Wait, wait, wait. Did you say hiking in Crocs? Yes. Do I have my Crocs? In? Very, very okay, easy. so this is a bonus section. I like Crocs, Crocs but how do you hike in them? One Crocs foot at a time. <laughs> okay. So typically, this is this is an expansion to that point because you asked okay so you have usually two two pieces of footwear when you're hiking is you have whatever your i recommend trail runners but whatever works for you and then a pair of camp shoes and by shoes yes, we mean usually camp cheap shoes, thank you yeah it's usually like cheap flip flop flops um but the people of the appalachian oh. trail are smart and they they use crocs because crocs are light they cover your feet uh, you can do water. They're way better for river crossings, which out uh, on the West, we have some really intense river crossings. Uh, so yeah, Crocs, exactly. strap some Crocs to the back of your uh, pack. Uh, they're, they're good to go. Like, I turned 40. Dude, Chad, I bought a pair I gotta of Crocs. Say, you were like, you were like speaking to my soul right now. Nick and I are backpackers. We did the Wonderland trail at the end of last year. Uh, and like, Camp shoes are something that I recommend to literally everybody for exactly that reason. Like at the end of the day, you want to take off the shoes you've been wearing all day, slip on something lighter. And also when you're crossing like a river, you don't want to get your standard boots wet. Yeah, definitely not. Well, and that was, I went, when I started the Pacific Crest Trail, I went without (laughs) camp shoes. And at the first shop, which was 40 miles in, uh, the first thing I picked up was a pair of sandals. And then halfway through the the Appalachian hikers had, had talked me into Crocs. Do you um, keep all the worn down trail shoes like tied to your back like corpses? Oh no, you tied like, so people see how many deaths it has taken to get you there. <laughs> no, nah, you wear you wear them, through. you wear them as a grizzly uh, as a cloak. Uh, thing on your yeah. on your uh, necklace. You, like a you necklace. Actually, like teeth. You, you cut them up and you make soup. Uh, so oh. when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you if you did that you and you didn't have a trail name, you'd be guaranteed to get a trail name within like 10 miles. <laughs> Yeah, oh, fucking guy. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all so. see psycho shoes? Yeah. <laughs> your, your, your trail name is walk faster, walk faster. There he is again. <laughs> well, the first girl I saw at uh, Crocs, her trail name was Happy Feet because her feet got destroyed in boots. Like these were some, and she was such a, like a happy, just small, like funny stoner girl, but her feet were just shredded. So yeah, she hiked a hundred miles in Crocs. Wow. I watched that oh Barkley Marathon documentary and. Those feet, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you take care of your feet. When you, when you go out, take care of your feet. If you feel a hot spot, you're gonna be out for months. Just take a stop, you know, get some Luco tape. Uh, you can order it online. It, they don't sell it at the store, but it's what Moleskin wants to be. It'll stick to your feet for like a week um, in water and all of that. It's great. So now we're moving the to the next- And it is not the notebooks. Luco, <laughs> yeah, Luco tape. Is it most, most, um, oh, most Yeah. Not, not these. The, uh, yeah. I try to stick those um, to my feet and man, they just don't last <laughs> my no. notebooks. No, I will say most can make really good, uh, trail journals because you can beat the hell out of them. They can get soaked all of that. Uh, like eventually when I get trail journals, they just get like folded up and like put in the back somewhere. So next concept. And this is the last concept for this presentation is where do I sleep? The big three. Uh, this is more trail slang, but your big three is your most crucial things you need to survive and also the heaviest pieces of your gear. So this is going to be your backpack, your sleeping quilt, and your tent slash shelter. Um, when it comes down to like determining how heavy your pack is going to be, which brings us back to the original concept of how sho- how heavy your shoes are going to be, because you're going to be walking 5 million steps. Uh, um, this is important. Like if you can get your, uh, big three under five pounds, you're probably going to be in for a much, uh, more enjoyable hike. So did you say uh, under five pounds? Yes. All three of them together. That's fucked up. <laughs> Nick, yeah, that's that's way are, too light. 
Okay, no, what check it out. If you say? have a pound and a half sleeping bag. I don't. Um, and you have We're a like gravity two pound blanket. tent. Yeah, I don't have that either. You, you have a two pound tent <laughs> and then you have a two pound pack. Um, no. These are doable. You could. But how much are, is that in stones? I don't believe you. This is achievable. Modern science is amazing. Uh, are you, you using some to... sort of like witchcraft to make this happen? Are these conjured from no. the ether dimension? He just uses no, one piece of saran wrap over and over. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> so just we'll, tin foil. We'll, get, we'll get to the science behind this um, because it is great science. Uh, but getting into your pack, which is you know typically going to be heavy. Uh, so I have your turtle shell, your home, your pack. Uh, people usually buy packs that are way too big, which is part of that heavy problem is your pack is too big, has too many compartments, um, has all these like extra pieces that you can remove that you usually don't remove like a belt and like the brain of the pack, which is the hood. Like you take that off. None of that. The other thing is you're going to get rained on if you're out there long enough. And the best way to weatherproof is to have a big um, garbage bag, like a heavy duty uh, garbage bag liner um in your pack so it's like you open your pack you put the liner in you put all of your stuff in that that keeps you safe from water and it's really uh cheap to replace and it's very light um so if you have many compartments you can't do that everything in the outer compartments is going to get wet and it's fine to have i guess like a couple but a lot of packs you know they're, they're just like skyscrapers on your back um if you buy a pack that can fit 70 pounds of equipment, you will pack 80 pounds of equipment. Like it's just gonna happen. I, I recommend aiming for like 50 liter packs, but that, that information is not relevant to you. What's relevant is when you go out and buy a pack, know that your instincts are gonna be to buy one that's too heavy. So I would say single compartment packs are lighter because you have less fabric and um, zippers. They're easier to pack. When you're out there long enough, you are not going to wanna meticulously pack everything. You're gonna to wanna to open up the mouth of it and you're gonna to wanna to shove everything in. Like usually you shove in your sleeping bag first and then your clothes and then odds and ends and then food and water. Um, now this is where it like kind of determines what kind of pack you want. If you have, there, there's a term called base weight which is how heavy is all of your equipment without food and water. If your base weight is under 20 pounds then you can go for one of those like one pound under one pound like cottage company backpacks. Um, you have ones without belts and without um, any uh, spine, like a spine in the pack. For those you wanna be like under 10 pounds, I don't recommend hiking that way. It's not comfortable and you should only do it if you're a nerd for ultralight. Um, and you'll know if that's you. For other people, like I think 15 pounds is a good reasonable number. I've met triple crowners, people who've hiked all three tra trails who've done like the 10 pound setup and like go back to a 15 pound setup just to afford some extra comfort or swords or what have you. Um, it's good to go light. A commander uh, so, deck, yeah. Right, so for example, the Osprey um, Exos pack is Osprey, it's a popular brand. They have a lifetime guarantee on packs, which is great because you will trash your pack by the end of a hike and they'll just replace it. And if they don't carry that model anymore, they'll just like give you what it, whichever one you want. Um, but the Osprey Exos is just over two pounds with all the bells and whistles. And you can remove those bells and whistles, which I recommend you do. Like take off the brain, take off the extra straps. I by, by like 300 miles in, I was sawing off extra things that I didn't need because it's just, it's, it's excessive. Um, so that's a two pound, it's like 200 bucks. It's a single compartment pack. Um, and it's pretty heavy duty. You can do water carries on that. So like if you're hiking the Appalachian Trail, you don't need a large capacity because there's water everywhere because it's the East Coast. But out here on the West Coast, there's no water and you're going to be carrying like three gallons of waters at some times as you're going through the Mojave Desert and it's hell. And so in that case, like I don't recommend cottage company packs unless you've packed them very well because they don't have the support and they're going to torture you. Whereas like the extra little spruce. So for everyone in chat, I imagine Osprey is a good brand to look at. And look, yeah, look at those two to three pound packs. If your pack is four pounds, you, you don't need to buy it. For one, it's going to be more expensive than the two pound pack. And it's also, it's just going to hold too much. Or this is all super serious and chat just making D&D jokes. Yeah. I, <laughs> I will tell you after doing this, I under, like I read Lord of the Rings and it's a whole different book. I was just like, okay, this, <laughs> this is a guy who walked a lot during the war. <laughs> <laughs> this guy I don't know though. S Sam's carrying multiple cast irons. That guy's he legit. He literally is. 
Yeah, yeah. like a sack yeah. of potatoes, God bless man. Him. I... I thought maybe if we'd find ourselves a roast chicken. <laughs> I mean, at least he uses them as weapons, so that kind of counts as a sword. Right. Every right. time I watch those movies, I just hurt because I'm like, oh, there's 80 pounds of gear on you and your shoes suck. He also has <laughs> all those <laughs> extra, all the oh, little extra pouches of weed. Yeah, but they so, like, also that's have extra yeah. pouches. Okay, it's like okay. tiny barrels of... Uh, of, of, yeah. of no, of the weed. hobbits are fine. I feel like the hobbits are fine. They're like, you know, they're, they're packed lightly. Like a, a hobbit is like a born backpacker. But you see, like Boromir with his big ass shield and like oh, armor. And fuck that. Boromir, that oh, guy's yeah. running around. Fuck Boromir, though. Yeah. Okay. Boromir's like, I'm on my first adventure from the big city. <laughs> so now we get to the exciting part of the PowerPoint where I just ran out of time. Give <laughs> <laughs> <Hell yeah. laughs> <laughs> me pretty short. Uh, your tent. Um, here's the thing: if you have two or three hundred dollars, you can buy a one to two person tent. I recommend a two person tent because you're going to want to spread out and a one person tent is like the size of a sleeping bag. Um, so it, it's going to be like six ounces heavier, but it's going to let you spread out. And especially when all of your gear is wet, cause it's going to happen. Let's you kind of like do all of that. Um, that being said, people, it's just good to know that people go out there with tarps and rope and we'll just set up lean twos in like blizzard co conditions and it. they'll be fine. I, um, can I add commentary, Chad? Please do. Um, yeah, I, I've got a friend. He, uh, he might be listening to this. I don't know. Um, <laughs> there, there's a whole thing uh, where, where a buddy of mine decided uh, that he was going to bike the perimeter of Iceland. Okay. Fuck <laughs> yeah. I had another friend, uh, another friend of mine too, who had lived homeless for a year in the United States and just biked around the country. And that friend had explained to him that he didn't need a tent. He just needed a tarp. Uh, a tarp would do just fine. And so he went to Iceland to try to bike the perimeter of Iceland with just a tarp instead of a tent. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, no. He's oh, no. still alive? Yeah, he's fine. But well, like, there you go. It, he did okay, but it sucked. And, and But this was the thing, is he didn't do the whole perimeter. The, the trip sucked. Um, but th that's the thing, is like knowing your tolerance for suffering is important for some <laughs> what you are willing to pull yourself through. That is true. Like, and yeah, when I update this PowerPoint, tolerance for suffering is key. Like when you get into, am I a lightweight backpacker or an ultralight backpacker? Tolerance yeah. for suffering is big. I am I a just heavy, see What do like, I need to chart yeah. between Airbnbs that have the best taco restaurants next to them? <laughs> well, you can you, be both. Yeah. You, yeah. Here's the both thing. Both is possible. Eva and I are definitely both. Yeah. yeah. If, you're, if your yeah. gear is lighter and you know what not to bring, you can get to each taco spot faster. I'm just going to say, and you'll have more you space have room to, for leftovers. to pack out tacos. Exactly. Yeah. The main reason I go lightweight, like my base weight right now is about 12 pounds with comfort. Oh my God. And, and it's pounds. not that, like, here's the thing. Is the comfort a single Kleenex? <laughs> <laughs> it's the sword. It's the sword. It's, okay. it's modern. Sword. Okay. It's med modern tech. Here, I'll, I'll show you. I use this as a foot rest. This the is sword? my. No. The it's very metal. <laughs> This has like two persons worth of like multi-month trip backpacking gear in it outside of clothing. So ain't, no, ain't no bear getting in that thing. Yeah, a bear. Well, a bear you box? need you need a bear can to go through a lot of California, and so yeah, same with here. You usually ship it. Oh, uh, Chad, can I share something? I want to share my Please. screen real quick. Oh yeah, can your kick. So down. yeah, you're talking. About, wait, this is the end of your presentation, right? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I've got one okay, more slide, cool. but the slide is just like this. There's nothing on it. So feel free to take over. Uh, okay, cool. Your... No, I don't want to take over. I just want okay. to share with you. So you're talking about having a, a 12 pound base weight, right? Yeah. Okay. So listen, I'm a luxurious bitch. I like my luxuries. Um, I want to share with you what my backpack, so my backpack tends to be around 30 pounds, right? Okay. I like my luxuries. It's fine. Yeah. I got, I got strong legs. I want to share with you the time that I packed it. Don't know what was wrong with me. The worst possible way. Uh, and it looked like this. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> See, to me, that still looks like small for a backpack. I'm like, where's like the big fold up, fold up camp chair? It's like so <laughs> far it's, out. It's that little gray thing See sticking that? out. That's your, that your camp chair. That's my chair. 
That is literally my chair. But I, I want um, the well, one that has like, but, that has like the beer koozie built in. <laughs> okay, I think yeah. I actually also brought a beer koozie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I like my luxuries. 30 pounds seems kind of normal to me. This, I did a shit is, job of packing. Yeah, no, I'm bringing just 30 pounds of summer sausage on this camping trip. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. At least two pounds. I, 30 least. pounds of weed, am I right, bros? I will say my my base get, weight is 12 really pounds. Anxious. However, I typically have like six pounds of water and 12 pounds of food. So I'm usually carrying okay. around 30 pounds. However, I gotcha. eat so much when I hike. I am like nonstop, just like both fists, Snickers bars, Nutella, gummy worms you like you name it, it. Like, just like a hiking yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dude, dude, gummy, gummies are the ultimate trail food they don't go yeah. bad they don't yeah. like no. i mean they weigh a little bit but they're like you get those caffeine oh, gummies so too good. oh totally yeah, yeah no i'm i'm like constantly <laughs> eating and so it's nice because my pack is constantly getting lighter as i'm getting um 30 well and here's the I thing i love that 30 pounds for like a week or two is also a very doable amount because no matter what it's gonna hurt because if yeah, you're going by like lightness of food too, then you can really carry like a big barrel of Cheeto puffs and still be inside that weight limit. To give you an idea- the barrel could I, be your bear bin. Yeah, to give you an uh, idea, when I got to the Sierras and I had to resupply- just opened it up, it's just Cheeto puffs. I had this full and then I had another bag this full for two weeks of food. Um, and I ran out yeah. of food. I, I pack cigarettes usually. I don't smoke, but I pack cigarettes when I hike because at altitude- with bears. No, you can trade with hikers. Like hikers usually get. <laughs> um, Dude, if anybody asks me on the trail for food, I will give it to them. You do not have to give me anything for trail. No, he'll, he'll here's be what, like, I mean, this is two weeks, and then like a day in, I'll be like, oh shit, I ate all the food. Oh, <laughs> shit, I ate all the cigarettes. I broke. I brought an e-reader with me. I broke it with Snickers bars because I had Snickers bars literally packed in every like I feel I packed my bag I packed the food and then I just dumped Snickers bars because they'll like mold around <laughs> so every possible free space with Snickers bars just it crushed my e reader I, I, still... I hope you put that into like the re when you tried to get it replaced what was the problem <laughs> just Snickers crushed by bars. Snickers <laughs> um but yeah it's usually uh through hikers will get bored and they'll start smoking like within a couple months just as something to do and they're addicted by the time they get into the remote location. Which ties oh, back you can into... make money on this trip. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> set up a bodega on the top of a mountain. Right. So if people know you have cigarettes, they'll come and they'll be like, hey, can I can I trade you? And they'll bring out like just an entire like roll of Nilla wafers. Fuck be yes. like, hey, for a cigarette. <laughs> yes, so you can. And for me, it's a matter of survival because I can't carry enough food to survive like long stretches in the Sierras. And so, yeah, packing cigarettes. Um, the last piece of good info. Oh yeah. So don't. So you're going to eventually die just because everyone gets healthy and quits smoking and you're expecting <laughs> them to need cigarettes. I, it would be, I would have to, I would have to walk faster. I'll say that much. Dude, people in the um, trailer are so nice. Like oh, I, yeah. whenever Nick and I are doing like a weekend trip or something where we intersect with the PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail, we will bring candy bars specifically for through hikers. And when we see someone who has that like kind of wolfish look on it's their face the and they're like hiking super fast <laughs> yeah. and they've got like a long beard or something. We're just like, dude, do you want, do you want, do you want some candy bar? And they're just like, yes. I will tell you, <laughs> I remember every single person who gave me candy on that hike. Um, yeah, I packed way too. Like, I, yeah. The last hike I did was uh, going around Tahoe uh, the September before COVID hit. And I brought way too much food because I packed for my hiker hunger, which I didn't have. And I just was giving it out to through hikers and it was great. Um, Amazing. Last, last lesson. Oh yeah. So don't, don't do a tarp. Like you can do a tent. There's lightweight tents and it takes like a minute to set them up. Um, but some people just like, you know, sleeping on a tarp, whatever your, your level of, of pain determines that sleeping bags, like mummy bags versus sleeping quilts. There are these things called sleeping quilts down as many of you probably don't know, probably know does not keep you warm if it's compressed the thing that keeps you warm from down is the loft when you're sleeping on down it's compressed and it's not keeping you warm so to work with this you can get a sleeping quilt which is like a sleeping bag that just goes around like this and your sleeping pad will fill in the bottom and it's lighter and it's usually cheaper you can get them handmade for like 200 bucks like really nice ones with like 
water resistant fill. Interesting. Um, I have never heard of that. Thank you. And the other thing is knowing what temperature your sleeping bag should be. Cause most mummy bags go like sub zero temps, which you're not going to be dealing with. Um, like I, I had a, a 20 degree bag to do the whole West coast. Now I go with a 10 degree bag cause I can get cold. Um, there were a couple nights in Washington up in the Cascades where like I couldn't sleep. I was cold. so cold. Yeah. But those were like I a couple. I spent many nights shivering in a, yeah. in a mommy bag. But those were like two nights as opposed to like, you know, 130 nights where like half the time I was sweating and throwing it off me. Um, Fair. Anyways, that's closes my presentation on like next time you pack for a trip. I don't expect you to retain this, but I do expect you to now know there's another way. Well, one way not to do it, I just dropped a Instagram photo. I hiked the um, the Catalina, um, tra the Trans-Catalina Trail um, on Catalina oh, yeah. Island, which is just off of Los Angeles. Um, probably the worst possible time, which was like, I think it was last, so we'll say on that photo, like July, it was, or August, it was like incredibly, incredibly hot. And I also brought my dog. Um, and I'm also an extremely mm. inexperienced hiker, camper. It was actually my first like long distance trek. And I had, I think about a bit, like my, my weight was like 45 pounds. And then my oh. dog stopped walking. <laughs> so <laughs> I, like, I had to carry him oh, for baby. about 12 miles. <laughs> oh my God. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a, um, I can, I don't know how to do it, share anything, but yeah, I had to like, I think people would pass us on the trail and be like, hey, cool. And I'm like, yeah, this fucker won't You're just walk. like, not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not. Your dog is like, bro, I thought I liked walks, but I don't. I fucking hate walks. <laughs> yeah, people just, oh my God. And this Catalina, like- And I how far did you hike? It was, um, how far was it? Maybe it was about 50 miles. That sounds about right. It wasn't, it wasn't huge. It was about, I think it was like, like, Five, four, four or five days, and it was. Nice. Um, but I think I, I'd never been to Catalina before, and it is like desert. It is like crispy, crispy desert. And my dog was just like running from like little shade bush to shade bush. Um, Our dog does that too. And a lot uh, of the plants on Catalina give off methane, so you're not allowed to light fires there because the whole island will just burst. Right. It's also full of buffalo, which is weird. Yeah, lots of but, bison. Huh. Um, which were brought there for the movies, I think, or there was like some like movie that was shot there in like the thirties and they like brought in Buffalo and they just left them there. And now there's all these like free ranging Buffalo yeah. on Catalina Island. It's a very God. strange place. California is so weird. It's, <laughs> yeah, this place in particular is very weird, but like I, yeah, we actually hitched a ride the last few ways. Cause I was literally, I think I was carrying about 70 pounds, <laughs> including my dog. It was horrible. How big, well, how, big is, how big is Neon now? He's now he's about twenty pounds. I think he was probably around fifteen at the time. Well, yeah. now we all know each other. So if you're ever going to go on a trip, I will gladly shake you down. Yeah, I'll tell you what you need to survive and what you don't need to survive, so that you can have room for like a couple fun, stupid things to bring. Like yeah. One of my, one of my hiking partner's uh, trail name is Golden Girl because he brought an iPad loaded with four seasons of the Golden Girls. <laughs> and that, that was his luxury item every night. You just load up with his like battery pack and stuff and watch a couple episodes before going to bed. That would be pretty amazing. In his defense, you know, a an iPad with nothing on it weighs the same as an iPad with four seasons of Golden Girls. Yeah. Sure. Well, and to go yeah, with that- I never bring a book. I just read on my iPhone. Well, and at this point, when people are like, oh, what are your luxuries? Like, my luxuries at this point are like an extra fleece. It's basically just rain gear that I probably won't need because when it rains, I my, I made it like 2,000 miles in before I wanted to quit. And it was because of the first rainy day in Washington. And but if you really want to bring reading material, you could just have your own custom soap label. Then you'd have your soap bottle. Yeah. You have a whole novel to read on it. And I had, words, baby. I had Dr. Bronner's with me. That's yeah. like normal trail soap that you have. Oh yeah, Dr. Bronner's is genuinely like you bring that while backpacking because 
It's the 13 in one. You can use it for literally anything. You can wash yourself with it. You can wash your dishes with it. It works if for every anything. night. You see another chapter on the old Bronner's. But I mean, <laughs> like, no, there was like a, like a soap publishing company that just used the Bronner's model and did like, you know, I wouldn't even say flash fiction, just like a whole novel. That'd be great. I, I would love to, you know, I, um, I need to suggest that to Neon Hemlock. They would totally do something like that. I, uh, I, I haven't uh, been sharing my writing a whole lot lately, but I still like every day I free write. Um, and I have like, you know, a crazy amount of just ridiculous nonsense that like, you know, I, but like, I think that's probably, you could just print that on, on soap labels and, and then just have it be like, you could even do, they have those, like those ibuprofen labels that where you pull it out and then it accordions. You could have like the, the soap label pulls out and accordions out into like the second volume. What if like- a, it, could be, it could be a trilogy on this fucking label. It was like Philip K. Dick's Exegesis if that was published on soap packaging. This is gonna be the stuff that survives when the aliens excavate us. It's like, well, it must've been very important because it was attached to soap, which was very important. Yeah. I want to hear Ewell's thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, we have wheel. one more presentation. Yeah, do we want to spin the wheel? This... Yeah, he has to spin it. Spin, spin the wheel of fortune. Uh, All right, here we go. Let's do it. Cool. <laughs> Who's it going to be? Arcana Axe. Ah. Four for me. Oh, it's me. So oh, it's Ewell. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a winner. Yeah. All right. I am so excited. I, I want to thank my fans and family. Um, no, nah, but um, before we get started, I just want to say um, when we're talking about free writing, uh, my writing tool, I've actually recently got a free write traveler. Um, for mine, I put a little label on it. So it's got a fake uh, Supreme label. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Do you little, like that? Uh, it's a very tiny laptop that has an e-ink screen that you can't see it. Uh, apparently hates which I think is really funny. It up. Yeah, but it's got a little uh, switch label, um, an e-ink screen. It's a really fun little um, writing tool that apparently um, looks like the background even when it's in front of me. Is so, that one of those OLPCs? Like the... It's a little, it's a little fake word. It's a little word processor, right? And it just goes yeah. up to... Do you like it? Because I've been looking at those. I like them. Um, I've got the big one and I've got the little one. Uh, recently, I waited about two years for it because uh, COVID an adopter. A nightmare out of their manufacturing and they ended up waiting like more than a year longer than they needed to. Um, but I, yeah. never, I never wanted to spend that money, but I've got my Neo. Yeah. And Which then is also showing up as background. Yeah. Yeah. I love all oh, these invisible <laughs> objects. Who knows what else is just like behind these people we don't know about? That's true. Yeah. And then I actually Ooh. like just think just in case like they caught on and people realized how awesome they were. I also have a second Neo uh, <laughs> and, and a third one. I'm gonna, oh my god! Oh my an, god. A, an item like were this is the one thing keeping me from finishing you? my book. I just this is that's the one thing that's gonna fix my productivity. <laughs> I, I highly recommend them. They're great. I got mine because of you, Richard. Yeah, I, I was right. like, should I buy this five hundred dollar e ink thing? And you were like, no, just get this like thing for twenty dollars. Exactly. I've used it a few times. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yule's doing a presentation about Magic the Gathering. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> fuck yeah! <laughs> um, it is in fact about magic. Um, whether or not any gathering happens, uh, certainly no deck building. Um, but is my screen showing the presentation? I yes. do not know this, but you know it is. Oh, right. Yeah, um, so to, today I'm going to talk about tarot. And I'm going to talk about, very simply, the general theory of divination. And why divination is meaningful. But I'm going to start by lambasting it and <laughs> lean to the tool of divination. Because I think that's interesting. Um, because it is worth being mean to and is worth being mean and critical of the history to get to why it is still relevant. Um, also, just in general, um, I started this out um, being just kind of funny about it. I got serious, I got funny again. Uh, sometimes I'll be serious, sometimes I'll be funny because it's a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, tarot, I've got about six decks within reaching distance um, as 
some people know about me and some don't. I spend a lot of time traveling the countryside reading tarot uh, when the world is open and uh, going to various places and reading for strangers. And so that creates a lot of interesting experiences along the way. I've been on all kinds of chaotic adventures. I love talking about them anytime in general, but that's me. Um, I'm a little ram check. I do a lot of writing online. I do a lot of tarot reading and writing about tarot. I do a lot of bartending and sort of hosting and making fun cocktails. Um, I've got all kinds of weird Swiss army knife little tools under my belt. So my presentation today is why should I, an intelligent person, talk to a deck of cards? This is <laughs> the, the fundamental question about tarot, and especially as tarot is going through a renaissance. Why do I care about what a tarot deck thinks? So let's get started. The case against tarot, in which I say, do not listen to anyone who says <laughs> hello. So we'll start with bullet point one. 1800s. Tarot consists of pages from the lost book of Thoth from the ancient Egyptian mystery religion of Hermes Trismegistus. Well, um, the whole matter of hermetic tradition in Hermes Trismegistus is interesting. Um, there is a whole mystery religion of Egypt um, that exists uh, largely in conversation with other religions that were big in Alexandria around the turn of uh, the BC AD axis, um, where you have a lot of early Christians, a lot of conversion between Egyptian and Greek mythology of cultural exchange. Um, you have the beginnings of Gnosticism. And what happens is a lot of occultists in the 1800s start looking back and saying, this is the source of some great ancient true religion. Um, there's some idea that begins to be born that out of Egypt came some great true religion that usurps all others and is thus superior to what we know today. Um, and that takes us to the 1900s. And that's where we get to, there is a true mystery religion that predates all others, practiced exclusively by an order of secret chiefs and tarot contains their secrets. Uh, between these two, if this sounds familiar to you, or if you're like, I am uncomfortable with this immediately, it's probably because it resembles ancient aliens theory on a very fundamental level, which is this idea that there is something more true than the world of the past and the world outside you that you were looking down upon. And a lot of these people from the 1800s and 1900s who were involved in occultism came from the waning end of the great colonial empires, uh, especially France at this time. Um, one of the big people who is a problem here is Ataya, um, is I believe how you pronounce that, though there's not really a correct way to pronounce it because his name is just backwards. Um, Ataya is a play on Aliette, which was his actual last name. Um, and he created this construction where the Romani people were secretly Egyptians who had come to Europe and brought with them this lost book of Thoth, this true book of religion from ancient Egypt, which of course is not true. Uh, that it's not where uh, the Romani people came from. They, they weren't Egyptian. Um, th that has been a horrible nightmare of racism and problems in general, but has haunted occultism for some time. Um, th that discourse continues to this day. I would not recommend digging into it too far to anyone. Ultimately, what you have is a huge problem where tarot gets this reputation of being this great ancient document. Um, something that happened a long time ago that is beyond human wisdom. And if you read it just right, you're going to get past all the problems of the world. And that's just not true. Um, there, there was never any such thing. Um, tarot has nothing to do with some long lost book of thought or hermeticism. 
Um, it's actually more, it's old, it's very old, but it's far more recent than that. Um, there's no great order of secret chiefs. There's no great deep secret in the past to tarot. And, and that's what I think is one of the most critical things to understanding tarot is being ready to set that aside. Um, th this tradition of problems is more than just tarot. Um, it gets into the problems with theosophy. It gets into the problems of all kinds of things that happened in those couple hundred years where people were obsessively trying to find something in the past that would validate their vision of the world and their vision of superior over it. Um, and, and so that is one of the big horrors of tarot in general is a lot of these people who popularized it were not acting with great sincerity. They were not people to look up to. Um, but the other thing I would say is do not listen to anyone who says we live in a cold dead universe where the very idea of meaning is a false comfort that leaves one's hands empty at every grasp, which is there is no reason to just look at something like tarot, which is, you know, vivid with meaning and vivid with stuff. And to imagine that it is a dead, cold artifact. Um, I mean, that's just what I whisper to the mirror every day, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, devoid of meaning, a dead, cold yeah. artifact. But mm. oh shit, I gotta hop on my stand up soon. <laughs> yeah, I think there, but I think it's really there's a very deep contrast between the forces that popularized tarot in this time, and and there are good actors too among the bad actors. And what I feel good about at least is that their work outlasted the bad actors. Uh, but nevertheless, there is still this long legacy of horrible things and occultism. Um, and those things are still being addressed and they create a lot of fights and it's good that those fights are happening in my opinion. Uh, but one way or the other, um, you still get to this sort of question of what is the stuff of magic? What is the stuff of tarot? Why do we still care about what a deck of cards has to say to us? So let's move forward a little bit. Um, and this is where we start getting into what's really interesting about tarot is in spite of the fact that there's this sort of false narrative of tarot having come out of some ancient Egyptian mystery tradition, the, the deep comedy is that the oldest known ancestor of tarot from the 1300s is in fact Egyptian. Uh, it, it did come from the Mamluk empire um, and it was brought to Europe via that vector. Uh, you do still have very old uh, traditions of tarot that came out of Islamic origins, which you can kind of understand this did not get talked about by some of these old problematic people. Um, but, you know, we, that's a whole other ball game. Uh, you move forward in time and you get to the Solabuska. Uh, the Solabusca is beautiful. It's not the first Italian tarot deck, um, but it's, in my opinion, the most interesting one because it's where most of the imagery of tarot comes from. Um, you get to the Marseille deck, another 200 years later, which is the one most people are familiar with um, in terms of what tarot is. Um, the next one that people are most familiar with, of course, is the one next to it, the Waitsmith. Yeah, Wait, um, Smith, Ryder. Yeah, yeah, Ryder Wade Smith. Um, I made people will probably find it on Twitter if they haven't seen it before. I made an alignment chart of what people call that deck facetiously because some people call it the Ryder Wade, some call it the Wade, some call it the Wade Smith, um, some just call it the RWS. Uh, there's a whole ball game of who do you want to credit with that deck. Um, Pamela Coleman Smith is a fascinating person. Arguably, her art saved the whole deck, and she is 10 times more interesting than the other people, in my opinion. Uh, but that is, um, that's a whole thing. Uh, it's the deck that made tarot popular, and it's the one you'll see most often in the wild. Um, and then after it comes the deck that defined a lot of the modern magical associations, the Thoth deck. And that one is um, a negotiation between Aleister Crowley, who everyone has at least a vague idea of who he is, 
and Lady Frida Harris, who was, I would note, not a Thelemite like Aleister Crowley. Uh, she was a uh, anthroposophist. Um, her entire philosophy was different, and the negotiation between them created a really interesting balance of art and a really interesting balance of uh, symbology where they got kind of... Um, if you read the letters between them, they're very feisty and they fit <laughs> in the design of that deck. And it, it's very fun to read. Are those letters published? Uh, what was that? Are those, are those letters published? Uh, you, I don't know if they're, I, I believe they are. Mm -hmm. If not, there are books that contain chunks of them. Um, the uh, Juan Milo Duquette book of the uh, history of the Thoth deck has a lot of chunks of the letters. Um, especially the ones associated with each card and uh, Harris's increasing frustration with Crowley. Um, <laughs> it, it's very fun to read, honestly. <laughs> um, Speaking but, of very fun to read, I, I would just like to point out that this, um, this arrow through time that begins in Naive in Egypt in the 1300s uh, and mm -hmm. goes through the Thoth deck uh, is pointing directly on my screen at Sam Greenspan's face. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I, I think like that. This is very interesting. Is the reason I I put this together is to kind of show that even though tarot doesn't really have this sort of consistent, there is a great secret mystery tradition guided by some great white brotherhood. Like that's not real. There, there's still a a sort of magical continuum of things that persist across time regardless of the cultures and stewards of tarot is, is there is still a general spirit to tarot that is preserved in in every generation of tarot uh, which i still think is very beautiful um so i'm going to keep moving but I, I think um i wanted to make sure this kind of got seen is you see all of these different cultures involved also the soul of busca italy in general is where tarot really becomes tarot as we know it um, that is where you start to see the 78 card decks. That's where you start to see the imagery that preserves from deck to deck. Um, and a lot of imagery from Solobuska disappears for hundreds of years and then comes back in uh, the 20th century. Um, most tarot art becomes geometric for a long time and then Marseille takes over. So let's move on here to what I think is the next important point. Uh, for the case against tarot, tarot is just a pack of playing cards. Well, yes, that's actually true. Um, <laughs> there's no other bullet points. So uh, to kind of demonstrate this point, I went straight for my French suit tarot decks. Um, and if you look here, this is kind of tarot hiding in plain sight. Um, all of the three cards you see there that are diamonds are not, in fact, decks of 52. They're not Hoyle decks. They're not poker decks. These are from tarot decks but they are identical to what you would expect to see in a poker deck, except the bottom right. Um, that's from the key master of tarot that overlaid the interaction between Marseille and modern poker decks, which is all of these are exactly the same thing. Tarot comes from Taroki. Um, it is a predecessor of bridge. Um, the first decks that existed were in fact playing card decks. Uh, that's how it always was. And that does not diminish their magic, but they were playing card decks. And that is a knock against the vision of them as being a secret religious order. Um, they were designed as games. Uh, that is the core of what tarot is. Uh, wands are clubs, swords are spades, cups are hearts, and coins are pentacles or diamonds. Um, the one place you get into tricky ter territory is knights and cavaliers, or cavaliers, if you will. Um, between those two, are they um, jacks or are the pages jacks? Uh, we don't actually have an answer to that question because the courts went from four to three. Um, the average deck that you buy today at the store has a jack, a queen, and a king. So... Um, the fact that there is a page, knight, queen, and king in tarot means that we actually along the way lost a chunk of the court cards. Um, also, it, the, one of the things I find funniest 
is there's this myth that floats around that the Joker is the fool. That is actually not true, and it's very funny why. Um, in German playing cards, which are different, I don't even have any pictures of German playing cards, um, there is the game of Euchre, which became very popular in the United States. But when Euchre came to the United States and decks were manufactured for it, and that's where a lot of our decks came from, um, there was this card called the Best Bower, who you might imagine is being above the jack. He's sort of considered the best possible jack. And he was the Euchre. And so what's funny is we ended up with the word Euchre with an E in the U.S., but because we're good at language, being Americans, um, Euchre with a J became Joker. And we ended up with two Jokers in these decks who took on the image of what it meant to be the fool. But what's funny about that is it's not the fool. Um, that was actually a semi-noble card. Um, and so we removed the fool from our decks, but it came back. And I find that very funny. Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of a Joker's trick in its own right. So <laughs> moving on. Um, I was um, I heard, so there is like a game, well, like French tarot is a game, right? It's kind of like yeah. arts. Yeah, so that's, that's the thing is um, you have the game of Taroki or, or uh, French tarot. Um, it, it, it's, an inter it's a game unto itself that has four players, which is um, why it's sort of a, a bridge predecessor. Uh, th there's a whole, um, whole thing about it. I admittedly have not had a lot of time to play it because it's not been my primary uh, association with tarot. Um, but it's out there. Um, it is a whole game, uh, and the deck existed for the playing of that game. And I, I well, I had... I a couple times and I think someone mentioned that I forget what there is a fool in that deck and I forget what it yeah. does exactly it like clears the board or something and I heard that the expression to play the fool it actually refers to that and not like pretending to be dumb or something it means like playing mm -hmm. the fool in a game of French tarot whatever that yeah. effect is I don't know yeah. I think it I think it tends it's both because I, I do know that the fool ends up being kind of the best card in that game. Um, there, there is a whole kind of poetic tradition around the fool secretly being the best card. Um, but I can't, um, I can't really verify entirely whether or not that phrase refers to that of playing the fool. I'm guessing that there is also a bit of um, theater overlap there <laughs> and in the question of uh, what happens with characters who... Uh, end up playing the fool in productions. Um, I, uh, but because of just the way those things work, there's going to be overlap in wordplay. Um, so I'd be willing to bet that sometimes that's part of the construction, but not always. Cool. And the French game, you kind of have the fool to do your dirty work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been fun. Later, guys. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm going to keep going. So um, Taro has a bizarre cousin, Minkiate. Um, I believe this technically translates to something like uh, the Jackasses game. Um, it's very, um, very different. I couldn't tell you a thing about the rules, but it's a beautiful deck and its construction is bizarre. And you start to see um, a lot of the esoteric and magical uh, becoming part of the norm in card decks. Um, so between the 15th and 17th century, Minkiate becomes a thing. It doesn't really uh, survive the test of time, uh, but there's 97 cards in the deck. Um, Tarot has an emperor, an empress, and a, a papess, or a high priestess, depending on what kind of deck you're using. Uh, but Minkiate has a western emperor, an eastern emperor, and a grand duke. And the grand duke is the one in the upper left here. Um, you have this very strange uh, situation going on. Um, the next card to the right of the Grand Duke, that is the House of the Devil. Uh, it's 15 here instead of 16. It would normally be the Tower. 
Um, but the house of the devil eventually becomes the house of God. If you look at a Marseille deck. Yeah, it does. And it eventually becomes um, the tower. And so there's a continuum there that's very strange, but this is a depiction of the harrowing of hell, um, which is entirely different than the imagery of the Tower of Babel. And I w- I'm not even sure that the tower depicts um, the Tower of Babel, to be honest. There's a few myths you can pick from that, are, that fit the mold of the later tower, but it's very interesting because the older decks do not depict that for this card. Um, it's very much the spirit escaping from hell. Like the harrowing of hell is like when Christ went down with the keys and let the souls out and the devil had to come to earth? Um, because they couldn't coexist in the same plane at the same time? or <laughs> um, th- So there's a lot here that happens. Uh, the harrowing of hell, there, there's multiple kind of tellings of it, but in general, when Christ goes down to hell, there's this idea that he sets the souls th- free for, through his sacrifice. Yeah. And um, there, there's this idea of the soul escaping hell, even though the soul has experienced it, um, which is gets its own kind of weird history. It's its own vector. In the I always like the idea that while he Christ is in hell, like the, the Satan has free reign on Earth because <laughs> they like have to not be in the same place at the same time. Yeah, it's like yeah. a box of sale. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a really weird, um, <laughs> a really weird thing, and I. Uh, it's really about the heart of the cards, but yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, here the next card over uh, number seven is strength, um, or here fortitude or fuerza. Um, there, there's a few different names for the cards. It's more like big dick energy. Sorry. Tremendous dick energy. Oh, um, Titanic dick energy. Yeah, it, it's very. Uh, th- I thought it was very interesting to big to duke energy. Up. Normally, you have the woman bridling the lion uh, when mm-hmm. uh, Riley goes back and works with Harris, and they make their own version of the card. They rename it Lust, right? But that was a huge sin, and the re- and the reason why is these f- cards used to be the virtues, the four virtues. Um, a card notably missing from tarot is prudence. You used to have all four in Minchiate. Um, and prudence goes missing somewhere down the line in the history of playing cards. You still get temperance and justice and fortitude, uh, but you lose her. Um, it's, I, I believe she ends up reappearing in the minors later on. Um, I, I'd have to look exactly which card, but um, that's an interesting thing about Minchiate. It has 97 cards. Um, it also has astrology. You can see over there, uh, card 28, that obviously does not exist in tarot, but that's Capricorn. Um, all of the astrology signs were represented in Minkiate and the elements. You also had earth, water, fire, and air getting their own cards, um, which, you know, each of the cards is associated with the elements and astrology signs via the uh, mansions of the moon uh, these days. But back then um the signs and the elements had their own cards too um and so minkiate is actually separate from our modern tarot tradition but you can see where some of the spiritual elements uh start to get invoked into tarot through minkiate um it's a very interesting deck um and i've got it next to me if anyone's curious about anything in it but um in general, it's cool. We'll keep moving though, because I got a lot of stuff here. Um, I want to show kind of the 1500s versus 1900s too as another of my sort of think let's hurt tarot. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, the Three of Swords in the 1500s and the 1900s. So on the left there, you've got uh, Pamela Coleman Smith. Uh, that's the famous Three of Swords. You've probably seen that as a tattoo on a person, whether or not you've seen it as a card. And next to it, you can see it's 1500s form. Um, That is the same card, right? Well, go to the right here. Um, On the left, you see the Ten of Wands as depicted in the 20th century. And you can see the Ten of Swords as depicted in the 16th century. Uh, This is another big question and discourse problem in the occult world is 
Did swords and wands trade places? Are wands fire or are wands air? Are swords fire or are wands air? Um, in general, I lean towards the modern, uh, wh which is tarot has bloomed and more decks have chosen the modern as their vector of being. Uh, but it is interesting to look back at the history. Uh, you can absolutely see that indeed um, the Ten of Wands as it is today is as the Ten of Swords was closer to the inception of tarot. And that's very interesting is are you going to look to the past or to the future for how you will decide what tarot is trying to get across? You're not going to do the future. Yeah, I prefer the future. I, some people don't. Um, it, th there's a lot of people who want to look to the past for it. And that's like one of the things that I get pugilistic about is I, I do think that if you believe in reality as a living spirit and you believe in tarot as a living spirit, you've got to look at it in terms of um, what is happening in the now is what is the most meaningful. Is If you believe that this is able to speak for itself, which if you're a tarot reader, you've got to believe that, then how tarot as a whole projects itself would imply what you got to look for. Um, but th there's still meaning in the research into the past. It, it's not a dis on researching in the past, though I worry that some people do come to that through a reactionary framework as they get caught in that vision from the first slide of looking to the past for meaning, looking for something more true than the world they live in. And I think that is where the most uh, crime and pain has happened in the world of magic is in trying to do that. So that's why I tend towards the future. I don't think looking to the past is bad, but I think relying on it um, will be the death of many things. So <laughs> moving on, um, <laughs> Loteria. Um, I, Loteria is great. And the interesting thing about it is it, even though it is largely a um, me Mexican cultural artifact and by and by larger it is, um, it does actually come out of Italy around the same time as Taroki. Um, it is sort of born of the same traditions and there's nothing, it, it, it's all still speculative. No, as far as I can tell, I haven't found anyone who has managed to do the research that says that La Luna is the moon, that, you know, El Diablito is the devil, that La Muerte is death. Um, there is no one who, will, who has actually managed to say that because a lot of the very old cards are gone. They're rotted. Uh, you know, they're missing. They, they weren't literary artifacts. They were things that people had. And we, we do know that it came out of Italy. We, we do know that uh, around the same time, the same things happened, but that's about it. Um, Don Clemente is the most popular version um, from it, in Mexico in the 1880s, you start seeing it come on the rise. And where it becomes interesting to me um, is I learned about tarot appropriati through uh, Loteria. Um, down at the bottom here, I've got um, El Gallo, the rooster from uh, Loteria. Um, every Loteria card has an associated verse. Um, the one that sang for St. Peter will never sing for him again. It's very great and ominous. I love that. I could not have written anything so beautiful. Um, Loteria has its own magic um, and it's its own independent thing. Um, but what it gets to is this interesting sort of uh, thing from the deep past of cards, uh, tarot appropriati. And the idea that when someone is looking at a card or pulling a card, this is an old game um, and it's a real game. And a lot of tarot was not just playing bridge, say. Um, it, Tarot Appropriati was a game of you pull cards and you construct poetry or you allude to inside jokes 
and you pull the cards and you people try to figure out what cards you pulled based on the things you say. Um, and it was a fun party game that was played in Italy hundreds of years ago. Um, and it's part of its own whole tradition. Um, but also you can start to see that happening in Loteria too. Um, I- is those stories of, uh, you, you see the verses, you see the poetry and you see the interpretations being car- part of what the caller does. Uh, someone had something to say? I can say when I was a kid growing up in Mexico, we played Loteria, but we just played it like bingo to win pogs. Yeah, it, it's bingo, right? <laughs> I mean, think about it. But it's interesting because it is um, it is a cousin to tarot, just a, a very strange cousin. Like it doesn't, there, there's no clear cohesion that says that they are together, except that they were born at the same time and have some of the same cards. Um, but the verses in tarot appropriati um, are sort of the thing that entangle them in time. It, is you can see the poetry involved in interpreting cards uh, becoming part of the structure of cards that far back. Um, uh, something I called out here was Enigma by uh, Daniel Martin Diaz, um, a very beautiful Loteria deck um, that tangles uh, tarot and Loteria together. Um, and it's a really gorgeous thing. There's a full box set that comes with Loteria cards, and you can use it as both a divinatory oracle and a um, just plain old playing Loteria. Uh, it, it's great. I, I think it's a great deck for uh, people who have an attachment to it. Uh, but in general, I, I kind of want to note that is in the history, interpretation of cards and poetry surrounding cards is still there too. And you can see it not only in tarot, but also in its close cousin. Um, so I'm going to keep moving here too. Um, to the next thing. So I'm going to get away from talking about why tarot isn't unique, why tarot isn't special, and talk, get even further away from tarot and talking about the I Ching temporarily. Um, so for those who don't know the I Ching, um, it is a very ancient um, divinatory technique where yarrow stocks are thrown, and the result is something in binary arithmetic that you can reconstruct into a divinatory meaning um, though it is not necessarily something that is used divinatorily. Um, it can be. But what's interesting here is if you look, we go from 1 to 64. Every possible arrangement of the yarrow stocks, because you throw them in this manner, um, produces a unique pattern. And that unique pattern, um, every possible permutation of it is included within the construction. Each of these have their own verse, each have their own lore. Uh, the transition between each of them also has its own story and transitional framework. It is one of the oldest and by far the most complex um, form of divination that exists. Uh, in spite of it seeming simplicity, um, I am not an expert on it. I would never claim to be. But the reason I bring it up when I'm talking about why do we trust a deck of cards is going to be when the I Ching moves west, uh, which is Gottfried Leibniz. Um, Most people who will know Gottfried Leibniz will know that it is because he and Isaac Newton accidentally invented calculus at the exact same time. That is not the only interesting, strange coincidence in the life of Gottfried Leibniz. The other is that he invented binary arithmetic at the same time that missionaries who had traveled to China were translating the I Ching. And the thing about the I Ching is, you know that that the numbers were one to 64 in the hexagrams. That's two to the, yeah, two to the sixth or base 64 arithmetic. That is the foundation of most modern computing. Um, at the same time, 
that missionaries in China were translating the I Ching and corresponding with Gottfried Leibniz, he was doing the exact same thing. He had worked for 20 years on this project of developing binary arithmetic, and he found out that it had already happened um, it, at the exact same moment that he completed his work. Uh, but this is why I think it's so interesting is, yeah, th this is where he sort of gets into, um, he becomes spooked. He starts to realize that this thing that he thought was going to be revolutionary, that he knows is the future of mathematics and technology, has already existed. And this inspires him. Um, Leibniz, in terms of mathematics, is known for his contributions to calculus, but his um, philosophical contributions, he becomes known for what's called the theory of pre-established harmony. Um, he becomes very invested in Tao and in I Ching philosophy. And he becomes, he tries to come up with a way to synthesize uh, the two of, uh, schools of philosophy that he knows via that. And he comes to believe that things happen in a harmonic state um, where everything that happens in the world happens because it happens the way it does. Um, he ends up fusing what our conceptions of mathematics are with divinatory frameworks. And what comes of that, here are his sort of personal notes as he's looking through this and trying to map it out, is the binary arithmetic by which you can hear me even speak. Um, the whole science of computing, of building an object that can speak and think, rises out of this interrelationship of thought, theory, and technology that was born from this communication happening. Um, it's a very strange thing. Two times in Leibniz's life, um, he came to absolutely groundbreaking inventions and simultaneously found out that someone else had done them at the exact same time or had brought them to him at the exact same time. And he ultimately comes to a conclusion in his philosophy that everything that in the world that happens happens at the exact same precise time that it is supposed to in accordance with the divine. If I were him, I would probably think that too, because <laughs> why would you not at, at that point? Um, both of Leibniz's great inventions were simultaneous with someone else doing them at the precise same time. Uh, he becomes sort of a, not a forgotten figure, like everyone knows his name who's in those fields, except for the fact that he does not become the top figure in either thing. Newton becomes more famous than him on that front. You know, he does not really become uh, any kind of great leader in math or philosophy, even though at heart he is. In his he did invent the phrase, fuck my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think that is a fair, uh, a fair thing is whatever that is in German, he probably said that. <laughs> Breaking my Lieber. Yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, too, there, um, Isaac Newton, you know, he was uh, notoriously an asshole, uh, just a just completely horrible man. Um, and he had been downing, he, he, the guy had just been drinking mercury for years, like actually drinking mercury. And just for funsies? Really came down on. As you do. Not until you so, try it. What was that? Sorry. Oh, uh, I said, don't, don't knock until you try it. Yeah, how does he, like, what's, a, what's a cocktail with mercury? Do you like float, does he float mm. the mercury on, you know? Uh, uh, what does it do? Does it just like get you like extra fucked up? Um, <laughs> mercury, I mean, so people get small doses of mercury when they eat fish, right? But like anyone knows you don't eat fish during pregnancy because of the poisonous quality of mercury. And in general, I, I think it just in general causes such nerve damage. Mm -hmm. That's the, the, the term mad as a hatter comes yeah. from. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Isaac Newton went crazy because he was trying to create um, a, a kind of a segue. Um, alchemists tried to 
to create, in addition to just like making gold, aqua regia, you know, wa the water of kings, uh, the great medicine whereby gold would dissolve in water like any other chemical. The theory was if you could dissolve gold in water, you could drink liquid gold and thus um, obtain the perfect medicine. And the only way you could do that, um, Isaac Newton, one of his lesser known inventions was uh, mercury amalgam, which was the uh, thing that people used to stuff I think they've got better stuff now, but um, uh, most dental fillings used to be made with a uh, gold mercury amalgam um, once upon a time. And like working for him and you're so confused. Do you want to make gold or you want to dissolve gold? Make up your fucking mind. Well, that was the thing was um, <laughs> that was the one thing that could turn gold liquid was if you managed to make a gold mercury amalgam alloy uh, that would turn gold liquid. And so that was the closest kind of structure you could get to the legend of Aqua Regia. And through it, you could get something like what they thought um, Aqua Regia would be. Um, and so that, that's a whole other ball game. Uh, but that's kind of what drove Newton insane was he really started digging into this, uh, into various Sorry. mercurial yeah. medicines. Um, and the consumption of mercury um, started to have long-term effects on him, and he became more and more aggressive towards other people as he did so. But yeah, uh, Leibniz accidentally, uh, not really accidentally, he accidentally invents the divinatory machine that is modern computing. Um, that is kind of the spooky thing that I'm going to talk about in the final segments here. Do it. I love um, spooky. Yeah. So the case against tarot becomes the case for tarot. Tarot is just a pack of playing cards. Well, yes, that's true. Actually, so what? What does it mean to trust an object? Can an object communicate meaning? And what actually differentiates learning tarot, learning from tarot than from any other object? I, to me, that is the provocative question that comes out of the fact that modern computing is built upon a divinatory scaffold, which is if you have any kind of framework in which uncertainty exists, you have something by which you are divining information. Um, yes, you can look at a deck of tarot cards and say, I am shuffling this in the motion of my hands is deciding what is going to happen. I can tell you mathematically that if you perform seven riffle shuffles, you have something that is chaotically impossible to discern the result of. Um, when you are looking at a tarot deck, you are looking at an object like your computer or your television or your smartphone or anything else you are carrying on your person that is information technology, and you are negotiating with that object and determining what you will and won't believe from it. Um, if you think for a second that that interpretation is simple and trivial because you are an intelligent person, I would ask you to look around you and see exactly what has happened to people who have chosen to trust these technologies. It's pretty trivial <laughs> in uh, the United States in uh, 2021 uh, that just because something is information technology and was human negotiated in its origins does not mean that it is a trustworthy object. Um, but that is what divination comes down to, is if you have an object that you relate to and you have something that you are negotiating with that object to ascertain information, are you getting the information you want or not? Are you getting information that you need or not? What is it doing for you? And that is where the magical starts to get into the picture of what is your relationship with these technologies. Um, in general, you have this long history of tarot, and a lot of what people believe about tarot is dead wrong, just terribly dead wrong. And that's okay, because there is still the long tradition and long tale of everything that's come down to tarot being part of a continuum of mutual trust among human beings about what different things mean. What you're getting out of a lot of other technology that is designed to provide information is not that, is not designed with any vision of human interaction that is mutually beneficial in mind. Uh, you're 
most of what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis is sales technology it is something that is defined to connect people via what one person has to offer one another. Um, do, you know, I'm not going to fault anyone for whether or not they believe in magic and practice tarot. I think to what degree you can personally negotiate with things that you don't understand is a personal relationship with reality that um, people will generally have to decide for themselves. And some people, you know, by nature of their own health and well-being, can not do that. That's fine. But I do also think that it is interesting that we have this problem of our relationship to things in this world. And our question of which things will we believe and which things will we not, which are considered absurd to look at and imagine we can derive meaning from, and which do we think are entirely reasonable to derive meaning from. Um, even if tarot is not the result of some great ancient mystery tradition, I think it being the result of some great ancient mystery tradition would diminish it more than help it. Um, which is to say, I don't think if there was some great ancient brotherhood that had maintained control of humanity, I would trust what they had to say compared to something that people over the course of 800 years of human history have built together through games and social interaction and mutual friendship uh, to actually build a common meaning structure. And so why would tarot not be a great framework for human beings to communicate? Why would it not be a great framework for humans to talk to spirits? Regardless of what you think is possible, tarot is a great piece of information technology. It's just not necessarily something that you would think of as information technology because it does not look like a computer, but it comes out of the same general framework and time frame. In fact, it is older in the structure of combinatoric works. Um, probability, um, tarot is older than probability even. Uh, probability comes out of Cardano in the 1500s in Italian mathematics, um, which of course is roughly the same time frame as tarot. It's when people start really thinking about probability and its relationship to human beings. But the cards are earlier. Games of chance and divination are much earlier than probability. Um, the, the technology that runs all of this, everything that we do today is built upon this older vision of information by which we learned how we could communicate with each other and how we could know each other. Um, when we're talking tarot too, I, I can't, and especially Italy, I can't not know Italo Calvino's uh, Castle of Cross Destinies, um, a whole book about human beings learning to talk to each other through tarot. Calvino is a master. Invisible City is beautiful. You know, on a winter night to traveler, like all of that stuff. Everything he does is built around that structure of storytelling. So I'm sorry, I get passionate about it, but in general, I think it's important um, thinking about how these things connect us, why we care about them, and how they relate to the things we work with today that have the same intellectual history. Um, and so this kind of gets me to this slide. Uh, this was, I threw it together, but I still think it's interesting. It's sort of any interaction you have with a divinatory medium, and I, I use that word very loosely, but if you have something, an object that you're gathering information from, uh, there, there's this idea of you have human mediated information and unmediated information coming to that medium and interpretation comes to you. And the question is, how do you navigate your relationship with an object? How do you navigate your relationship with a thing? Especially if that thing has an uncertainty engine built into it. How do you look at it and say, I care about this or I don't? And that to me is very interesting, is we have uncertainty engines and objects that provide us with information, whether or not we agree with it or understand it or even trust it, uh, we live day to day with that, especially under COVID. And the question is, how do you navigate whether or not that is something that is providing you with something meaningful? For me, tarot provides a lot more meaning uh, than the laptop I look at every day to work. Uh, but that's besides the point. Um, 
this is something I put together that's very Richard inspired, <laughs> which is what is divination? And this is just me spitballing. But the, the first kind of equation I came to was divination equals space plus time plus medium plus identity. That's the general, you have an object in your hand. What are you getting out of it? Um, and this is you in a particular moment at a particular point in time are navigating, looking at something and who you are. Or the other side of that is if there's two people involved in which divination equals space plus time plus medium plus subject plus radio plus agency, which is you have two people involved and a possible action that can be taken based on that negotiation. But there's all the space and time involved. There's always the medium involved. There's always some object that defines the way people are relating to one another. And I think that is the core of what the divinatory is. And it's why I think the divinatory is crucial to understanding exactly where we are in history, which is, it is basically what is, when you have this thing in front of you, do you trust it? When I tell you this through a divinatory medium, do you trust me? I mean, that's exactly what makes it a valuable discussion. So I believe that is it. Why should I, an intelligent person, talk to a deck of cards? Because you're talking to objects all the time and you trust them, you nerd. That's me. That's all I got. Cool. Thank you so much, Yule. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yule, that was fucking amazing. That was wonderful. Damn. <laughs> Something, uh, um, something I, I think about a lot is, um, oh, I was totally fascinated by the concept that probability is, uh, the concept of probability is pretty new and that, yeah. and that it comes after tarot. That's crazy to me. And yeah. I was thinking about just like the, uh, the relationship between the divine and, uh, and chance. And I'm that back into the chat, give me one sec here. Um, there we go. Stop share. Okay. I'm back. I'm back as a human. Sorry, I wanted to make sure that I was being human uh, when I returned to this. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that I have a clear thought here, but I was just thinking about the relationship between uh, the divine and chance, and that especially if you live in before the concept of probability existed, mm -hmm. that shuffling cards and and getting uh, meaning from that, that you're you're literally dealing with the fates in doing that, right? Yeah, it, that's the thing is um, before people were thinking about with probability, because even past the invention of probability, it's not like that became a part of the public eye either, was fortune and luck uh, develop as ideas with games too. And, a, you know, obviously the dark side of that is gambling, mm -hmm. uh, but the not, the, the less dark side of that is that human beings have negotiated with systems that they can't predict or systems that they can't understand for a very long time. Like what is a deck of cards, but an unbound book? You are looking at a thing and you're reading a thing and you're deciding, do I trust it or not? Um, do you trust the thing more or less because you're reading it in a particular order? Um, that's a huge and interesting problem to me. And it's a very interesting one that we can't comprehend where we are now because we know too much. <laughs> We can't get back into the idea of, you know, if, if I shuffle a deck of cards and, you know, let's say it's a tarot deck and I do 78,000 draws, I use a computer to help me, I'm going to get every card exactly a thousand times or something close to that. Like, it's not going to be interesting, but that's why a reading is a point in space and time and a pull from the medium is it is part and parcel of this where am I now and how am I navigating working with something? Are you also Here. saying that like every object in life is a divining object? Potentially, yeah. Yeah, like this pen is like an object of divinity because looking at it is making me like think about it and then someone and something. It could be. Though. I think divination in general is... Like they're all axioms that you come off of or... I think divination ultimately is an object that you're specifically looking to for information, right? And, and that's kind of why I'm thinking okay. technology is like, 
what are you reading? You know, what are you looking for? Like, are you trying to, when you look at the back of a Dr. Bronner's bottle, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. what are you looking for? Like, are, I'm sure there are people out there who have picked up a Dr. Bronner's bottle and the first sentence they've read has decided whether or not they're going to break up with their boyfriend, right? Like that person exists. That, that's a, a oh. that is assuredly. It seems like that's, um, it's the, the, whenever you pick a, whenever you interact with anything in, in the sense of you're looking for meaning, right? That's a sort of mm-hmm. ritual where you are. So you could do that with literally anything. If you get yourself into a mindset where I'm going to find meaning in this action, it could be literally anything. It could be shuffling mm-hmm. cards. It could be, you know, uh, following a twig to water or, you know, it could be uh, <clears throat> like the grain of, on a piece of wood, like the whorls and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and is I think about, that, is it more about approaching any object with a mindset of like that meditative divinity? I think, I mean, that's the way I take it. I think that there's like a there's there's a a, a state of mind that's um, that's like the uh, yeah, it's the I don't know what to call that. Yeah, it's uh, oh, because oh. that's like you're describing like a calling. It's like okay, is this pen like an object of divination, or is this Doctor Bronner's is the first sentence like resulting in me doing that? It's because like whatever whoever you are as a human being and wherever you are and whatever you're dealing with you are called to whatever that object is and whatever meaning it's conveying to you which is making it useful to like make a decision in that moment or at least think about it which yeah, is really know. interesting I love, how can i like make every decision in my life based on like this bottle of teeth that i have <laughs> yeah so throw it's the kind of like it's kind of like the entire world and all its ephemera is a coin that you're just flipping at any given moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm horrible at, at decision making. Uh, I'm, I'm just an indecisive mess in life and always have been. And, uh, and at some point when I was a teenager, I, I recognized this. And so I started uh, at first just carrying a coin with me in my, in my pocket and uh and then um, anytime I had to make any sort of decision, I'm sorry, this is a big tangent, I would flip it and then see what the coin told me to do. And then I would only know what I actually wanted to do based on, oh, no, that coin is totally wrong. Yeah. Like, yes. Uh, oh, I, I, you know what I do? I, I actually, on my phone, I'll say if it's if the time that comes up when I look at my phone is an odd number, I'll do this. If it's an even number, I'll do this. And then I'll pull it up and be like, you're fucking wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> Go and do, get the tacos anyway, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so I feel like, like when you're flipping like, a coin, well, that's like a... That's zero like a, is even and odd, so... <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that again? No, you're saying like you get this, like, you know, it's like nine o'clock, you're like zero. Well, zero can be anything. (laughs) Because you're using a coin to like force commitment. You're saying I will commit to like X or Y via this coin. And then you know whether you wanted, you know, if it lands heads, you're like, I wish it landed on tails. Yeah. Unless you have some like form of morals to chance. You can just go. Okay, no, now I know what I want to do. Like I've had people do that. Just psychology as opposed to what. UL was actually talking about with like divinity, divining. Um, I I actually have an opinion on this. So I I think what it is, is you're basically deciding that you're looking down the path of this universe that you deciding to go with the coin or the number or whatever you're picking is saying to do. And you're looking down that path and you're saying, do I agree with the Jordan that walked in that direction? Like, no, that guy's an idiot. I'm going this way instead. (laughs) That's, I really love that. I, I think um, in general, I am way more um, down the uh, magic is real hell path in the way I do things. But I, I think I really like that model of um, do you agree with the person who followed that journey? Like if the coin is telling you this, is that not a way of the spirit showing you exactly who you are yeah. on that on that part. yeah like you're, you're mentally totally. prognosticating what that future would be and then being like yeah is that good or not you know yeah totally yeah. and i think-, think about uh like a coin being like a 50 50 thing there's two outcomes but then uh the complexity when you add more possibilities to it and when you get a, a full deck of tarot and the relationships between all of those cards um then you're getting like it's it's conjuring like a very full view of where you are and what your problems are your, and your obstacles and where you're headed. And um, 
and uh, I don't know. I, I just, it's like, uh, so I started with a coin when I was a teenager and uh, I, I use tarot or the I Ching now. And um, I don't have a firm belief on whether there's a, anything actually spiritual or not with that for myself. I'm open to it, but uh, for me, it's, it's like a, a more complex version of the coin flip. And, uh, I, and I find it really meaningful in that way. Yeah. If you're looking for a more complex version of the coin flip, can I interest you in the dice uh, of a Dungeons and Dragons game? So yeah. that, so I'm um, working, or like, I've got a small team of people, we're working on a new show, which Richard has signed up to be the narrator for, even though he doesn't even know what it is yet. Uh, you've but, been very vague, but you're a bunch of people. But it, it gets into the idea of this almost like analog MMO played over the phone that people use. And that was something when I was doing the writer's guide, because it's pretty much like you call a number, you give your, your passphrase and your call sign, and you're set up with Richard's voice, who's going to basically take you on a journey. But you're the one who determines where you go. So each... I love this episodes like five minutes long and we're getting completely different people on completely different journeys based on like what decisions they've made Human and teeth. yeah th and the methods of determining like what you can do are you have a coin and a six-sided die and you can generally choose which one you want to do am i going to leave this up more to chance and flip the coin which is like great risk great reward um or great punishment or do i want to do a six-sided die and get a gradient um, which kind of determines. And so like when I was doing the writer's guide, because I'm trying to make this where like I can have three or four new writers for every batch of episodes so we can just get a big variety. And I'm Hell like, yeah. th think of the coin and the die as forms of divination. These, this isn't something these game creators were like looking at Dungeons and Dragons because in the fiction, this was like being put together in the 70s and early 80s. So it's like they were taking this as a form of divination because then there's the question of like, what is Richard's voice? Is it a computer? Is it an eldritch being? Is it just a guy? And is it on a deterministic path? And therefore, like the math that goes into like Jersey. a six sided yeah. die or a coin helps actually make limited options. So you could conceivably have this in like a hundred year old computer that's like all switchboards and whatnot. And mm -hmm. so, like the whole time, so that was something I wrote on just like, don't think of this as like, or rethink the way you play D and D as like when you're rolling these dice. That is divination within the game itself, because I think that's a really interesting way of playing. And it's usually kind of more where I try to go with it. Yeah, and, and that's really uh, this divination is in in uh, as information technology, uh, like tabletop gaming is a world in which information technology and divination are the law of reality. Like yeah. you roll the dice, that's what happened. You yeah. know. Well, yeah. you, you have human agency there, but that is absolutely it. Like, that's beautiful. Side tangent for Nathan, who is showing dice. These dice are the ones that are full of human teeth. And these are also the reason that I have a P.O. box because um, I, got these, <laughs> I got these in the mail from someone on Twitter. And my wife was like, you're getting a P.O. box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's cool. I, I'm fine with the cult thing on Twitter, but when you they were human, right. we start getting yeah. human teeth in the mail, mm. you're getting a P.O. box. <laughs> yeah. Man, um, I, I, I can't I, wait, Chad. That, this sounds exciting. Oh, also, I know, yeah, that I'm sounds, that sounds fucking rad. Also, I, I just want to um, say that uh, I haven't been producing much uh, audio drama stuff lately. Uh, I would like to get back into it. Uh, but I also think that people should hire Nate here in the group because okay. uh, Nate is awesome in every way and has the most amazing voice in the Accurate. world. Accurate. I noticed yeah. that Annie's also a really good creepy writer. Yeah. Yes. I'd, well, yeah. and I'd, I'd love to hit because I was planning, I mean, you all doesn't even know this, but I was planning on hitting him up to talk about the game system and then have write on it because it's like eventually, and like Richard, I wanted you to write on it. But yeah, I'd love to have you guys involved I will like, we're kind of slowly doing things, but I also need voices for the operators, which is the person you call to get set up. who are like just regular people who just know too much about whatever, is this a game? Like, what is this thing? Yeah, um, I, I yeah, have just started branching into writing for fiction podcasts. I'm writing ooh. for Old Gods of Appalachia now. Oh yeah. Ooh, yeah. Cool. It's a great show. Um, but yeah, I would love to, I, I put my Twitter in there. It's at Chad Manic. Oh yeah, I followed you. Yeah, I'd love to slowly like bring everybody into this because 
how it started was I wanted to like make a weird fiction anthology series so that I could pull a lot of my favorite podcasters into one spot so people would look at them because like most of them made their show between like one to many years ago and they have like a, their own thing. I'm like, I want like a nexus in which people can find all of this. Um, and so you had like the infinite now, which I'm like, okay, I've got to like pull this into it. Perfect. But also to get like baby podcasters, because there's like uh, the Great Chameleon War is one of my favorite surreal shows right now. And it's like brand new and hardly anyone's listened to it. So it's like pulling him in so we can kind of just get my a nice mix. Brand new one is the Silt Versus. Silt like Versus is so good. my fucking mind. It's yeah. so good. Silt Versus, I love Silt Versus because it's a show that I now don't have to make. It's the kind <laughs> of show that I would normally like put effort into making. And I'm like, they did it. Yeah. What is uh, it called? The Silt, the Silt Versus? S I L K B E S I L T T. I'm sorry. What yeah. was the one, uh, Chad, that you mentioned uh, prior to that? The Great Chameleon War. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just write, write these down. I just got to the end of the last arc of Friends at the Table, and I'm gonna probably be listening to something else for a little bit. Yeah, well, in Great Chameleon Wars, I think it's not that many episodes, um, at least for the first season. Yeah, his. Um... It's like a awesome, absurdist, surreal uh, poetry, uh, and then his sound design is really something exactly. great too. He's the one I'm working, so we're working on doing that and like using all these synths to build synthscapes and stuff for Love the background of the show. Because hmm. um, the other thing with the show or the, with the game is like any good role playing game has multiple editions, so it's like you have the authentic game that you need to play with a bone die and a coin of your country of origin because now you are tapping into something like else. And then you have the second edition, which is the more gamified one. So like for the authentic game, I'm building it on this because this is like no digital, all analog hardware. I'm like, okay, let me like build this out of like electrical currents that people had access to back then versus, so we're like doing all these little secret tells so that the discerning audience member can eventually figure out like, okay, what is this episode that I'm listening to? Like, okay, who's writing it? Where does it take place? All of that. And what what yeah. is the final outcome of this? Like, what is it? <laughs> it it's going to be a fiction podcast. So it's just going to be a micro fiction, five minute episodes written by eventually probably like dozens of different But with people. different paths, like a choose your own adventure? No, it's going to, oh. you're going to see different because the idea is that like, this journey could take you anywhere. And so like the consistency is that these are all like real life people, but when they're playing the game, there's some people who are like, one of the first episodes is a person who's in like a union war against like a dock baron. And they're trying to get to this like cursed beast in a cave that does a blood curse that will kill well, you yeah. and everyone within two generations. So they have the dock baron's blood and they're like, this will kill the dock baron, his dad, his grandpa, his son and his grandson thus giving it that but then you have like an episode that's just a really cute like dating interaction between like the person calling and the operator and like i want to do one eventually where someone's like did you know there's voice acting in this game like besides just the main voice which is richard's voice and yeah in this one town there's like a dating simulator and like oh, so the game is kind of fake right yeah it's the not game is just a, the game is just a story structure exactly okay yeah, yeah it's and the appeal as opposed to following the same character for a long time as you're seeing many different like people in many different places yeah and slowly uncovering yeah. the mystery of what the it's like the is. meta structure that you're hanging all the stories inside yeah. of yeah like the idea is make a simple core that then like i can onboard writers because the other thing is most of the people i want to collaborate with we're also busy like we all have two shows of our own yeah, this and way I can life. do a little short episodes. Exactly. And one and done. Yeah. So I can bring someone on and be like, it's 900 words. Like, can you write 900 words? Like, we'll take care of the audio. And it's COVID friendly because it's day. all over the phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that, yeah, that's been the latest thing, which I have like six scripts for it, the different writers. And every writer who stepped onto it is like taking it in a completely different direction, but that still feels like the same show. Share some scripts with me so I can get a good feel for yeah, it. That, that, well, sounds, that sounds super rad, too. Uh, yeah. my, my friend Karen in the chat says that uh, this this reminds them of uh, the tabletop game from uh, Disco Elysium, which I was thinking earlier. So which, here's here's the thing, or right? Or Beyond the Gates. I started playing Disco, and then my game crashed like before I got to the second day, and I got busy. And then the, the Justin Hellstrom, who wrote The Great Chameleon War, who's the first person I reached out to, was like, this sounds like this game in Disco Elysium. And I went right then and spent the week beating it. 
And yeah, it's like, I wish that game in disco was real. Like, which reminds me of what <laughs> Yoel was getting to about like, you can have different ideas at like different people can have the same idea in different places. Like I saw That's like, that, me, was, like me and Nathan with yeah. um, singles in your area. Yeah. Like, Cause I was, I was writing um, live singles in your area tweets and I saw this article from IO9 that was like uh, the person on Twitter who's writing hilarious uh, singles articles that are secretly creepy. And I'm like, Oh shit. IO9 wrote about me, but they wrote about Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> I would have your fans would come over and be like, "Fuck you, man! This is your you're ripping I'm off so actual person." I'm like, I'm so "I don't sorry. know who that is." Like, because I I I didn't have a Twitter before. Like, I only got Twitter because I'm friends with Man on We in real life, and I would be t texting him like these jokes because I, I I came up with the idea from seeing singles ads on Facebook, and it was like, but it said like Christian singles, but then it'd be like a girl, like a super sexy bikini girl. And I was like, what thing is behind here writing these that doesn't understand what it's writing? And honestly, so I, like the live singles part of it was always super sus. Like live as opposed to <laughs> what? As opposed to dead, yeah. <laughs> yeah, live is actually a better tagline. I always did it because I had seen hot singles in your area. Oh, in yeah. The ads. yeah. But I, live's better. <laughs> it worked in 2013, though. It was a completely different. Um, yeah, different where Twitter was a thing then. About. Now it's not oh, a thing. Oh, man. Yeah. The good old days. I remember um, a year before that, my my friend Mitch like sent me Time Scanners uh, Friends tweets of like different episodes of Friends, the one with X. Right. It was like, yeah, and I did those too, and I don't think I've ever read yours. Yeah. Yeah. It's like weird. I, we all had the same idea. <laughs> no, this is it. Is I had never seen. Um, I didn't join until like at least a year later, like that had always been on my brain. I'm pretty sure I made one or two of them, but like, that was just, it was like back then it was just all about, there were ideas, there were things to break and corrupt that were good. Yeah. And there's certain up. phrases that are just so ominous, you yeah. know, like mm -hmm. the one with blank. And yeah. you throw yeah. that in with so it's, many good things. It was like, it was like a really, yeah, it was like a really weird time too, because there, there became uh, this community and this sense of like, it was it was this weird, like living within comedy and poetry where mm -hmm. uh, you would just log on and uh, and you're all like, there was no sense of like, that person's ripping me off. You're, you're all just kind of riffing on each other's jokes and poems constantly. Yeah. yeah. It's just sort and of- that's, that's how I felt, but then people would get, people were getting mad. I was like, I'm just writing random <laughs> shit into this thing like it's my diary, man. Yeah, it like, was I'm not even um, trying to do anything. Pure here. convergent evolution, yeah. too. Yeah. Like, I, I think you and I, I, I never Everybody in a million years crabs. thought that like Twitter would be like the <laughs> thing that let me quit my day job. You know, hot like, singleization. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, Everybody no. eventually <laughs> evolves into a hot single. Exactly. Yeah. How long did it take for you all to communicate with each other directly? Because that that was like I I didn't get on Twitter until what twenty the end very end of twenty seventeen. I think uh, I, really? talked to, yeah. I talked to I talked to Nathan pretty early, but not a lot. Like I just I think I DM'd you and I was like, "Hey, I'm sorry if this was like I was apologizing about it," and you're <laughs> like, "No, I don't think you're ripping me off," you know? Yeah, I I I realized what it looked like. Um, and like the way you described it and the fact that you knew my friend Phil and uh, Phil McAndrew, um, like it all just kind of- I published Phil. I know, Grimal can trust. <laughs> like, um, but like the way it all kind of stuck together, I'm, like, I'm pretty sure this guy's on the up and up. So like, I, you're good, man. I'm, I'm I wasn't sorry. even like, I mean, that was way back then. I wasn't even like, never in a million years did I think there was money involved in like writing yeah. stupid jokes on Twitter. There isn't for uh, me. Um, <laughs> it's it's you weird. Gotta, you got to start a t-shirt company owner, and then have more more <laughs> popular friends than you wear your t-shirts on a role playing game show. <laughs> right. I I didn't uh, start talking to people on weird Twitter for like a while. It was one of those things where I think there was this like mask that just had to be up yeah that was anonymous until like 2017 2018 well and that's yeah. what i was wondering because the vibe of all of them is very much that because my first exposure to it was richard like he sat next to me during PodCon one i didn't know anybody 
and we just, we just started talking i'm like what brings you here and he kind of like walked through the history of like oh, i kind of come from this like weird twitter verse <laughs> and then explaining that to people a couple years later meeting you all at a party and being it just being like you're talking about tiki bars and you're like you have a tarot deck and you are doing like a blog or talking about like a blog of fake tiki bars this feels so much i'm like <laughs> In the same way we're in Doctor Who, you have like the Time Lords. I'm like, I feel like this is the same species as my buddy Richard. Doctor yeah. Who? Yeah, it's like, oh, I know who Richard is. <laughs> right. And then you're just like, what? It's like, oh, God. You're like, yeah. He's yeah. About, like, yeah. And so it's like, okay, this is this is now clicking. Because I almost quit like in 2016 because I was bored mm -hmm. of writing hot singles tweets. I just got super bored of writing the same tweet format. And, and the only reason I kept doing it is because I switched to like, it's me a person and writing just random horror and instead get, of like the hot singles format. Yeah. Did people get pissed? Because when I changed to people be- People were really mad at me. Like I, I, people would DM me because I have open DMs. Yeah. Uh, and people would just DM There's me like, I will let you man. know I'm, I'm unfollowing you because you've lost it and stuff. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay, bye. You know, well, like- That was me too. Is I switched my avatar one time to being a human after being a um, Yaka Burma um, image for a very long time. And that pissed people off. <laughs> like I, I, I got a lot of rage. Yeah, that sense yeah. of like possession that fans have. It's like you, really it's weird. Like yeah. you become a sort of saint and now you've like revealed like, no, actually that's- so Yeah, like people were really mad when they found out that, that um, Hot Singles was a mask presenting person. Right. For a while, yeah. Yeah, I started off, it, it, it was just a creative pursuit, and uh, I almost always did all caps, and it was just absurdism, and then I, you know, I, I did all caps like I thought I was supposed to, because, Everybody did all because caps. Daniel yeah, did it, what you do. do, so I thought He's all of do. Twitter was all caps for a while. Yeah, People <laughs> got mad at me, people yeah. got mad at me, like when I, I tweeted a few things with like no caps, I like got a lot the of no replies. caps was wow. like creepier though. Well, I, oh yeah, no, I, I mean there was normal really capitalization. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, love I, doing I, I did that and I, I like did a lot of stuff in character as as time scanner and uh but I started to get kind of weirded out by um people interacting with me as if I was some sort of like a uh, weird sci-fi guru or some nonsense and yeah uh, that happens a lot it, it yeah. made me feel really uncomfortable uh, I was I was working in comics publishing as like an associate publisher and I would have people come to the uncivilized books table and be like is the abyss here? And I'd be like, oh, fuck. You know, because like the other comics people next to me are like, what the fuck is that? Like, that's fucking weird. You know? Wait, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I follow with the whole like sci fi guru thing. Can you tell me more about that? Uh, I don't know. People were, people were weird. I don't know. Because yeah. well, we all do, we all kind of do that with gothy, weird, creepy inspo thing, you know? Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah totally. But, yeah, like, tear oh, out the throat of, the well, day that's that why comes it, for you, you know. Yeah, that's why it feels like sainthood to me. Of yeah, just like re you're, realizing, you're saying little, like you're, you're having little weird Twitter scriptures every day, and people, start, yeah, like people get them tattooed on themselves, and they like it means things to them. And that comes <laughs> it's just a fucking tweet, bro. <laughs> no, but it, I mean that comes with a certain responsibility yeah. if you're gonna write those kind of things. I think. Well, somebody you know. told me because this like, is why I, I deleted mean, my very, very old Twitter account back in the day. I had a Twitter account since like 2008. Um, and I deleted it, I think shortly after the, uh, shortly after the Trump election. Um, yeah, I was curious. I was like, my God, I don't follow you. And then I, I saw you online called out. I was like, Oh, I feel terrible. I don't follow. I don't follow Nick. But then oh, I, no, I, I deleted my account. account. Yeah. I deleted my account. account. Yeah. yeah. Is that because I, of the, the call out? <laughs> <laughs> now, it was, it was mostly, I think we talked about this earlier, how like Twitter around, around 2016, Twitter like took a sharp drop of like, this isn't fun anymore. Yeah, it was yeah. not. Yeah. This feels like this feels like it's a not being fun in like work. 2014. It feels, it feels like news. Yeah. I think some people saw like in the loose and weird Twitter saw a few people get making a lot of money. And then there was a lot of sour grapes, I think, that mm -hmm. they weren't, you know, which happens in any creative field. That I'm, you're money part of. I'm, I'm bad. You don't need money. I'm making any money. I, 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 <laughs> I haven't seen well, any of this. Right. My, my intro to like the internet world was fiction podcasts. And so like my Twitter account was like my show's account. Um, but then people said, be yourself on this account. Like, I think James Oliva gave me that advice. Who does What's the Frequency? 
Um, and What's the Frequency is a show that you would think would have like a brand and like a very specific way of typing. Instead, it's just tweeting hearts at you and everything. It was like, <laughs> okay, that's handy. And then I found like, I would get kind of annoyed at shows that would tweet like in character, not because yeah. like it wasn't fun occasionally, but because I'm like, well, I want to know who you are. Like, I want to know who's making this thing. Yeah. Cause like I'm really making a thing and I want to, yeah. yeah, when 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 it's something like that, uh, I think that is something. It's weird when people don't break character and they're. Promoting. I started having a lot more fun when I broke character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it started be feeling like an actual part of my life, not this art project that I did every once in a while. Yeah, you know. Well, I've started I've started hiding out on my show's Twitter again because I finally made a personal Twitter and I went back to my show's Twitter because like, oh, I'm only following shows here. This is why Twitter wasn't a hellscape to me because I'm just like <laughs> seeing other <laughs> podcasts come out, see what people are doing. And now I'm following all the creators and it's just like, oh God, world's on fire. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm running I'm running into a kind of a weird problem like that right now where like I, being a photographer, I spend probably more time on Instagram, even though Instagram is in just the final stages of a deep, deep nosedive into the yeah. earth. Right. Um, Oh my god, it's a miserable place. It's Instagram, Instagram. <laughs> my my, my into Instagram ball. is all like funny cats and knives and food. It's okay, like, the, I love the, it. but then look at <laughs> look at the interface, man. It's just like a fucking oh, shopping yeah, mall. Oh yeah, when they check, like I still have like a slight aneurysm every time I go to try to hit like the the, the middle button. The middle button, yeah, it's not yeah. That it's the wrong button now, and I'm yeah. No, but it's it's interesting. Like like you mentioned that breaking character from like your your character account is what made you feel better. Like I, in in Instagram, I'm finding like I, I recently started a, an Instagram account that's just kind of like a kind of like a photo a day photo project that I haven't really done before. Um, and like posting there is actually just like oh I have like this project to do, and now I'm just like completely neglecting my own like personal account. So. It's interesting. It's like the opposite of what you're explaining. Yeah. From the mercenary viewpoint, it probably would have been continued to be more popular if I hadn't broke like the, the immersion because people like more of the same. They just like getting the same shit every day. That's like why there's comp titles and publishing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But for me as a creator, it was going to become really stupid really quick. You know, it's just sure. like for a time, right? You like you, you don't want to just be doing like the su the su graphs and things, just like being stuck with like doing the alphabet over and over again forever. Yeah. You know? Like, and, and then you die before you get to Z. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it would be pretty sad as a writer if I didn't come up with a new a new joke format in seven years. You know, like <laughs> like like it's very funny because I um the name Ula Ramchek is a mistake. I forgot to start change. I used to just like take different last names or different fictional characters and swap them out. And I forgot after a while and some like tweet blew up. I, I can't for the life of me even remember what, but people just started calling me that. Like, I don't care if people know my legal name or not, but I think it's very funny that I ended up with like a pen name by accident. The whole idea of me having like an inhuman identity was an error Mm. simply not change or was it was. and it's funny to me because it's like as soon as i changed my picture to a human avatar i had broken kayfabe for a whole ton of people <laughs> and at the uh, at, at the height of weird twitter i yeah. actually uh my um my picture was my human face yeah and uh, and I often had my actual name as the, you know, as my screen name or whatever. Time scanner was still the app. But at the height of weird Twitter, I was like my picture was human and my tweets were not human at all. <laughs> um, and then um, and then when I when I created the, my symbol, the, the League of the Secret Knot symbol, um, I, uh, I put that on there and I. Uh, I don't think I've changed it since. It's just it's been that for years now. But I'm not but, as long as I know. See, your yeah, brand you, is your brand is too strong to break. That, yeah, I think <laughs> when, I, either, when I switch, you are the it's brand. It's like a regular person tweeting creepy shit, or it's like an interdimensional symbol, like you know, preaching to the choir. Yeah, when I switched from Buster Keaton to an actual picture, people got confused because <laughs> I had well, Buster Keaton for like six years. Uh, don't you mean H.P. Lovecraft? <laughs> oh my fucking god. <laughs> oh, even more than people 
one of my pet peeves is people saying that I write Lovecraftian, but even mm. more is people thinking that beautiful Buster Keaton is H.P. Lovecraft. Wait a minute. So You're telling me I haven't been following Buster Keaton this whole fucking time? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, look at this beautiful man that look at from, Lovecraft. These are not the same person. From 2016 <laughs> to now, you actually wouldn't have been following. Never mind. It's one <laughs> over attacking people from the early 1900s. I, I think uh, there's a lot to talk about in weird weird people who need to go <laughs> evolution well and it, it's interesting to me too how like new media trends like play into this because it feels like right now people want to know the they want to know who's creating the thing they're almost more interested in who's making something and how they're making it than they are in the thing itself like mm -hmm. for audio drama that's a lot of what drives it i think is like almost the amateur quality of it is like the little chinks in the paint and everything. And someone's like, oh, this is a human being making this. This isn't some like glossed up corporation who's like spitting out a TV show. Yeah. And that's now, to, you know, you've got Q code and all of that happening. But. Yeah. Well, being able to interact like with by having like your um, Discord. And I think what people are buying into with that Patreon and all that stuff is being able to interface with the creators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really just um, like the concept of your media being your friends. Um, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, like all the, the media you're consuming are from your actual friends. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Totally. Like, you know, and I like the music I listen to these days is generally I get things I'm listening to and then I tweet like, hey, send me some weird music to listen to. And people send me all sorts of you know, recommendations. And a lot of times it's their own thing. And um and so, reading things with friends write and listening to their shows. And I, li I like uh, replacing, I mean, I, you know, I still watch Star Wars and whatnot too, but, uh, but to have a large chunk of that replaced with, with your friends' media is great. And I, yeah. I, love, re I love reading Yule's, uh, Yule's Substack and yeah. So um, you circumvented parasocial relationships by taking your actual social relationships and taking the, the, media that they've created yeah i guess so yeah well and that's the whole where like i realize i'm like i don't want an audience i want flexibility and mobility around other people who are making things the way i am it's like i want to be able to hit up someone who writes something i like and collaborate with them more than i want whoever's following me or whoever's following them yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. It's a, it's um, yeah. A creative community is the, is the point of creativity as far as I'm concerned, you know, and uh, um, like right. yeah. it's, and it's really hard uh, when you're an adult and you've got a job and stuff like um, and you're a parent. Um, but, you know, like uh, I went to art school forever ago and I uh, was a painter and printmaker and um, you know, like in art school, like, yeah, you've got this like great community of other people that are making stuff. And like every waking minute, I was either making art or I was hanging out with friends that also make art. And, uh, and it's just hard to find that uh, in, in real life. Um, so it, like, that's been really great. And, uh, you know, the different com creative communities that, you know, there's like weird writers and, and people I met through Twitter and, um, and the the audio drama community um to, to be it's like it's overwhelming now because there's so many people making stuff but like especially there for a, a short time it was like it was a small enough community that you could actually know most of the people making things and um man that's what it's all about i love that yeah well, and for me right now i'm trying to find out like where my comfort zone is because i'm now working for a show that's huge and like my roommate's on the show and she's gone from like 200 to probably 20,000 followers in like a year. Um, what show just, is uh, Dungeons and Daddies. Okay. It's, I like the title. I've yeah. heard, I, 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 have, I have friends <laughs> that, that yeah, like people in my D&D crew love Dungeons yeah. and Daddies. Yeah, I just edited my first main episode today, uh, but I've Amazing. been doing their behind the scenes, the scenes stuff. Well, and with that whole crew, like they're like YouTube royalty from what I understand. Cause it's like, I met them through someone's house like when I moved to LA I wasn't familiar with their work and now this is like years later the niche thing they're working on so they had an audience but like oh, seeing their God. discord and seeing like the amount of fan interaction stuff I'm like oh I don't want that and so now I'm like okay what how do what do I put my name on I'm fine with the people who are like 
read the credits and then find me and follow me because it's like okay that's fine but it's like man i don't want the attention like the players are getting for example like i i want to stick with my like you know to me my dream twitter is like one to two thousand followers most of who are creators who i like and then vice versa Mm -hmm. um because yeah it seems like it gets overwhelming yeah i have friends who who are part of like an actual play thing that their fan base is nightmarish to me (laughs) i'm sure they love their fan base but to me they're (laughs) they probably don't and like and i just get to see it because the only reason i have a day job a day job that is t-shirts is because they would wear them on their show before i even knew who they were and Mm -hmm. i was wondering why i was getting all these sales for these dumb t-shirts from tweets and then i I realized that it was in conjunction with this role-playing show because i never even watched twitch before then yeah but yeah just seeing just seeing how their fan base is so possessive and got weirdly possessive of the t-shirts right it's nice that the dungeons and daddy's (laughs) crew has gone through multiple like they had a hulu show apparently like they um for rocket jump like they've gone through so many different levels of like super relevance to irrelevance and know how to deal with fans so when they started dungeons and daddies like they had everything just locked down they had their community relations manager and so that's been like it's been useful for me to see how that works and how like that changes kind of how a community grows because then yeah you see some stuff and you're just like this is a tire fire um i'm I am afraid. I don't. I, I'm gonna go back to never interacting with someone and just enjoying this the in ships, private. Man, it's all about the ships. It's all about <laughs> the ships. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> when people start shipping your weird Twitter account, and then you like change to your actual face, and then they realize, oh no, it doesn't fit my ship. And oh, so that's the ship of Theseus. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, had that one locked and loaded, ready to go. <laughs> hey, have you heard of the, the ancient Greek hero, uh, Bophades? Oh. <laughs> Bophades nuts. <laughs> and here I was stuck on WandaVision. WandaVision had a fun Ship of Theseus moment. I want to make something like that Ship of Theseus book so bad. Oh, yeah. I've got a collection of books that just look like that. Even if I don't care about the book, I'm just like, these are neat objects. Yeah. Oh, that was the one with all the things in it. Yeah, yeah, like with like an actual the actual texture of a napkin with printing on it, which I can't imagine how fucking hard yeah. that was to print on. I, I have a copy of that. I have not read much of it, but I like it as an object. It's yeah. Cool, I, here's here's the problem with that book is like even though J.J. Abrams didn't write it, like most things he's associated with, the more you like learn about it, the less good it gets. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I like about it is as a print object. Right. Like if you read the yeah. book and ignore all the extra ephemera, it's like a really fun book. Um, or yeah, I, I only like the ephemera. Yeah. And then when you go through the <laughs> ephemera, it's an interesting, it's an interesting mystery and it adds context, but then you get to the end and you're like, Oh, okay. That's how it works. Yeah. Which I never gets, read it. I just looked at all the ephemera and it's like, yeah, I'm going to use yeah, these ideas I've, for something. I, I've been doing my uh, first Twin Peaks deep dive of my life. Like I've seen the first season a couple times in my life and it was like good, but I didn't, but like now I'm like, okay, I've watched, you know, I just watched Fire Walk with me the second for the second time a couple nights ago and just like have these. I have never made it through season to two. Dive I've always into. like been halfway through season two and then quit watching. I, well, this was the first, I watched season one and I got so sucked in. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, or this is my chance. I'm going to like get the books. I'm going to read through and then I can just feel it in my heart that it's not going to be as weird at the end as I want it to be. It's weird. I I will say like, if you get into the meta of it, it's weird. But the main thing it's taught me is just the value of not giving you all the answers and what happens like when you give an audience all the answers and how it can just kind of like kill a part of media. Oh yeah. That's that's storytelling. That's like the best part of storytelling is like giving people like just a nugget to, to make them think like, Oh, tell me more about that, and then you don't tell them more about that. Uh, exactly. Well, it makes me feel That's better about my shit. own show because, like, I Station Blue is the first thing I ever wrote, and I didn't know what mystery boxes or any of that was. And then I like learn about them, like, oh yeah, I got some of those. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my whole Twitter thing is writing Flash that you never get the ending for. <laughs> <laughs> if you make it into a thing, then you never have to say how the story. Figure out how the story ends. <laughs> Friends, I have got to get to bed. Yeah, yeah same here. We've, we've been hanging yeah, out I guess it has almost been night. Thanks for hanging out, guys. We should uh, do this again. We've got a couple ideas. 
one is that we can get together. I mean, I actually made three different presentations for this one because I couldn't decide. So I've got a couple that are almost done ready to go too. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of horse facts stuff ready for mine. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited to learn all about true facts with horses. And the cults, and the cults that feed them. I was going to do a presentation on how I thought I saw a UFO when I was seven years old. Dude, we yeah, need to do a UFO so slash ghost yeah. story presentation yeah, night. That yeah, would be I amazing. Yeah, I can we can do a presentation on new paranormal meats stories. and how to chew you know them. Uh, if new we, meats. <laughs> we could TM, do the new uh, meats. ghost and UFO one on half a ween. Six months from Halloween. What is that? Is that April 31st? April is that right? 31st? Yeah. I don't know. I just said no math on this show. That's my mom's birthday, but we could, it's like a... I like that we were supposed to know the date for a made-up holiday right away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. 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 We could do it for we half a week. Out. Um, yeah. I'm, I'll, I'm excited to make an actual presentation and not just... Though I would like a collection of these. It'd be fun to have like a session one, session two, just like in their existing um, of the pre PowerPoint that you can just like flip through. Like I saw in the chat, someone made like a cryptids hot or not. I'm like, I want to see cryptids hot or not. I, I would love to present great. that one again because that is by far the best thing I've ever created in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> I love it. This oh yeah, the the other one it's a uh, you know three hours of similar to this. Um, that it's still on my YouTube if anyone wants to rewatch it. Um, and then um, I mean, I guess there's the idea that like I could separate them out if people wanted to find just specific presentations. Oh, well, you can actually do timestamps now on YouTube where oh, okay. in the links, you can mm -hmm. actually link to the specific discussions. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. I want to find a way to play this on the thing because like I all yeah. want to hear that. I yeah, I, I wish I could play it for you because I built this for tonight. Um, oh. I just like oh, no. threw it together. It's very, guess. That's perfect. It's very weird. Um, it's very much like West Coast synthesis philosophy of it's not musical. It's like evolving noises, but love i love noise um like soft know, eddies of sound washing over you yeah if we're, do, if we're doing a spooky one of these i will do my tales from the road of the things that have happened on the many journeys that I yes i i dearly want us to do a spooky one of these but i will say that literally every presentation i thought up is i just wanted to tell stories of times where i thought i saw something spooky and did or did not um, I want to hear so. about all of UL's like <laughs> spooky happenstances on the road. I thought I, was, I saw something spooky, but it turned out to just be a mangy dog. I just I know, was, just yeah. so you know, all of mine will always be fictional. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm not researching anything real. I'm just making shit up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I will tell one that's never been told publicly that I, I really think is uh, worth some, uh, worth some joy. So Great. I'll uh, be, uh, we, we should do it. Wait, let's do this. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, but next time I just want more than one day, like yeah. advance notice. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, no, yeah, it has I, to be the day before. <laughs> I just saw. I the, did make the mine in twenty four hours, Twitter, and I was like, "Oh, Jordan, why didn't I invite him?" Yeah, Jordan should join us. So yeah, just, as I started doing, I'm like, "Oh, I gotta have all these graphics, and I gotta like I, everything I do gets too much, so like I need advance time to make it too much." That's true. Yeah, my brain is also like that. I have uh, scope creep. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like I, I was like, I sold a bunch of knives the other day because I collect knives and I sell them. I was like, I'm gonna put a thank you note in there, and it ended up being like this hand tea weathered like fake yeah. handwriting note <laughs> that I made for all of them. I'm like, yeah. fuck my life, man. That's, I was like adding more and more work to my great. life. That's why the new project is microfiction. It's like collaborative microfiction because yeah. I'm like, I cannot take more than 900 words from you. That's all you yeah. get. I'm sorry. And, and as a writer, like the idea of just giving words and not having to do any of the other parts of putting it together is amazing. Yeah. Because yeah. every podcast I get involved with, I end up being like, oh, you can do graphics too. Oh, you can do this. And it's like, eventually like you're doing sound. Ah, you're well, teaching this, yourself YouTube sound as you're trying to do it. <laughs> this is why I love voice acting on other people's shows because I can put in my work. I can make my voice acting as good as possible, but you know, all the other stuff and, and make, whether that's it turns out awesome or not, that's all up to someone else. They get to worry about that. Yeah. Love that's, it. That's that's part of the like introduction letter pitch for people I'm working on with. It's just like all I need from you is this. We'll take care of everything else. If you want to get involved more, like I'm open to hear your ideas. Yeah. But like, yeah. Well, I, you know, my hope my hope is that I'll get inspired, and then I'll want to write stuff for your thing too. 
everybody so far everybody who's like read for it, it it's like the best kind of competition and one-upsmanship is like because you'll have your own idea reading the concept and then they'll read other scripts and be like "Ooh, i want to go over here and do this yeah. like someone's working on a possession story right now which is the idea of what happens if you call the game and you give someone else's credentials okay. um and the idea that the game recognizes that and like the npcs or people in the game like if you had a dog in the game it's going to act treat you as if you're possessed and then like next time the actual person calls they're going to be somewhere else and they're gonna have to like put the pieces together so like just there's so many just weird things you can do with the idea. Good. And so it's fun watching how each person like runs away with it. Great. Send me some scripts. Yeah. I'll, All right. I'll send, Thanks I'll for hanging out. Thanks Beautiful. for hanging out, friends. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Yeah. Thank and you so much. Your faces. Thank you Good. to all the people who came and uh, listened to us talk and watch these presentations. Yeah. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. You, you know, did, we all did some great presentations. They were, they oh, were great. Incredible. There were a lot yeah. of comments that I, I didn't like catch and i can only see some of them on youtube but i'm if anyone wants to talk i'm always happy to talk tarot and weird shit so i'm around yeah and you can go back and scroll through the the comments afterwards once it's up yeah. on youtube I, I saw a whole bunch of them i'm having trouble getting back further but i'm sure i can you know, yeah i thought once, once it stops being a stream it should be easier yeah, I meant to have my Chromebook open next to me with YouTube so I could see the things, but my uh, it, it wasn't working. So, all right. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Uh, good meeting you all. Yeah, yeah. it's good to good see you all. Out. Good to see you.